Welcome to your sanity safe space with your favorite YouTube podcast duo. Skag 3, whoever he is. Get your plug fascist ass out of here! Saving the millennial generation in weekly installments. You are a terrific team on all counts. Live from a castle tower and his mother's basement, this This is the Matt and Blonde Show. I'll lead an effective strategy to mobilize true international over the person. <laughs> hey, why the fuck is the gas so hot, bitch? Out here in the fields, I fought for my meals. The Supreme Court has agreed to take up the issue of whether former President Trump has immunity from the federal election subversion case that he is facing. What it says is that they are corrupted political actors who act in bad faith. Somebody needs to start listening. I don't need to be forgiven. Don't you understand, you dumb son of a bitch? Don't you understand? People in the media have to stop pretending that the Supreme Court is some kind of benign institution because we will keep losing every day. We allow these six Republicans in robes to rule over all of us. I doubt it. You are fake news. Shut up, bitch! Look at that big ass. Look at that big juicy booty. Oh my god, bro! That's disgusting. Fed, 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 fed. All right, America, go to the YouTube right now. Big ups to Rebecca for keeping that woke. Congratulations to both of you. You're awesome. Yeah, five, four, three. I can't do it. We'll do it live. (laughs) Fuck it, we'll do it live! Hello and welcome to the show. It is a great show. It is a terrific show. It is a tremendous show. Frankly, the very best you can ask anyone about that. People often do. I'm told this is the Matt and Blonde Show. My name is Matt Christensen. I'm flanked on my right, as always, by my wonderful co-host, Blonde. Welcome. Hello. How excited are you for Super Tuesday? This is practically your Super Bowl. Actually, which do you hate more? Which do I hate more? Uh, Well, I got to say Super Bowl because we have to delay the show. Ah, fair enough. Super Tuesday gives us content. That's true. It's Nikki Haley content, but, uh, you know, it is content. Even Nikki Haley is probably more excited than you are, though. To lose in all 16 Super Tuesday (laughs) states. Earlier today, though, she offered a hint. Maybe come Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. She might be ready to quit if you read between the lines. Let's I'm see not, about that. I'm not getting my hopes up, though, yeah. Uh, we'll get into that in a minute. Plenty of big news this week, as always. The Supreme Court agrees to hear Trump's presidential immunity appeal in his Jack Smith January 6th case. Uh, there's the legal question here. That is actually secondary to the practical reality, which means that that case is now delayed months And it all but assures that there will be no trial in that case before the election, which may mean, depending on the outcome of the election, there will never be a trial (laughs) if the machine allows Trump (laughs) to become president again, which is a bigger question on its own. Hey, what if that's what they want? (laughs) It's always what they want. There's there's always there. Yeah. Trump becoming president is the 4D chess move. Hey, it's I'm their serious. 4D chess move. They were hitting Biden pretty hard on SNL. Who would allow that unless they wanted Trump to be president? I, I, I saw a little bit. Uh, I saw the opening montage bit or the opening, uh, the cold open, they call it. It was uh, painfully um, unfunny. Just. Yeah, it usually is. Although um, there was, I, I don't watch SNL regularly. The one funny thing I saw you recently. You don't? <laughs> no, it's, there was a time. But. Speaking of a time back in the day, one of the bits I really loved was the Barry Gibb talk show with Jimmy Fallon and and Justin Timberlake. And they brought that back a few weeks ago. It's too it's too hard to explain it to you in a reasonable amount of time what this is and why it's funny. But it's a joke political talk show featuring the two brothers from the Bee Gees. And Ellie Mistel, the guy you just heard in the intro there, which we'll get to later. He was one of the guests played by Keenan Thompson in this bit. And Jimmy Fallon as Barry Gibbs said, you look like Don King ate another Don King. (laughs) And the guy kind of does. But we'll get to that later. That joke's not that funny, but I swear to God, that's the funniest joke Saturday Night Live has had (laughs) in a decade's time. Do you see that Uh, guy's, uh, uh, what was his name? Sean. Oh, man. Everybody was talking about it. His opening bit on SNL. 
this last week. Oh, the uh, uh, Shane Gillis you're talking about. Shane Gillis. Yeah. yeah, that was really funny. I did see that one, uh, but I didn't see the full episode. I mean, I, I tuned in because obviously he got booted from um, Saturday Night Live a couple of years ago on the basis of what his racist podcast or something like that. I can't remember what the whole controversy was. But anyway, we'll get to more um, more from the Don King who ate Don King later. Uh, we'll also talk closing arguments. Uh, In the Fannie Willis disqualification hearing in Georgia, even more evidence has emerged this week, demonstrating conclusively she and her boyfriend have been lying their asses off the whole time. The FBI. How is it possible there's more evidence? There's still more. And I'm sure there's more they're still having. In fact, there's one of the guys who just brought out this additional evidence teased that he has more evidence potentially coming tomorrow or Tuesday. So trust me, there's more. Their corruption is uh, is bottomless. The FBI arrests Blaze reporter Steve Baker for his conduct on January 6th, which, as far as I can tell, is verbally expressing his appreciation for what was going on. He may not have damaged stuff, but he liked that stuff was damaged and he did that out loud. So he must pay the price. What about the trespassing? He he, he trespassed. He trespassed while liking that people were wrecking stuff, I, which is some kind of enhancement factor, I guess. Uh, also Hunter Biden testifies before uh, closed door uh, congressional committees and offers as far as I can tell something of a Donna Brazil DNC email defense. I was high and drunk when I sent that text that was fake. That's how it worked. Mm-hmm. Plus we have hoax hate and tonight's movie review is hot fuzz. So stick around. Will I like a British comedy or not? Find out later. We'll catch up with your super chats in between topics as well. 10 bucks and up. On the Sunday show, because we are no good low down money grabbers, it will be all this and more in your favorite couple hours of listening material. Remember, you can find everything show related and support the show for as little as a buck a month over on the website. That is Matt Christensen Media dot com. Listener support is hugely appreciated and it is what keeps the show operational. So if you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the show. We also have show merchandise for sale on the site. Plus, we have offers from friendly listener-owned businesses as well. This week's feature business is our friends at Western Razor Company. Most razors sold today are made in China by global conglomerates that hate you. Well, not anymore. The high noon safety razor from Western Razor is made in America with all metal, no plastic, long-lasting construction, and uses widely available double-edged razor blades that only cost pennies each. Safety razors were used by just about every man in America back in the 50s and the 60s until the big razor companies figured they could make more money selling disposables and signing you up for endless subscriptions. But the safety razor has always been the superior method for a better shave at a lower long term cost. And don't forget, Western Razor has teamed up with fellow listener owned business Kineo Mountain Woodsmithing to offer finely crafted wood razor cases as well available in walnut or maple store or carry your razor with exquisite style and organization also manufactured right here in the United States of America. Western razor has all your shaving needs covered from razors to blades to accessories and even shaving cream. So shave better and less expensively and support American manufacturing. When you pick up a Western razor, get 10% off your entire order using promo code Matt 10. That's code Matt 10 at checkout with Western razor, 10% off all of their fine offerings You can find everything you need from Western Razor, plus other great offers from the rest of our friendly listener-owned businesses, including Hope Innovations, Phoenix Ammunition, Kineo Mountain Woodsmithing, and more at mattchristensenmedia.com slash deals. Deals by listeners, for listeners, and of course, don't forget, you can also try out all three of our signature soaps with Hero Soap Company. There's Timberline and Old West from yours truly. There's Oat Plus Almond from Blonde. Or, of course, you can try their shampoos, their conditioners, even cologne now. A nice solid cologne without the mess. Promo code MCLISTENER for 10% off everything at HeroSoapCompany.com. Find more information likewise at MattChristensenMedia.com slash deals. All right, on to what is really important. I have a DVT update. Deep vein thrombosis. DVT. Last night was... uh, a very happy occasion in my household because I took my final blood thinner pill and then my wife and I went out to a celebratory dinner. Oh. I have taken blood thinners every day since the the great DVT incident just before Labor Day last year. Man. So those pills are gone. 
hopefully I don't immediately clot up on stream and <laughs> die suddenly or something like that. Uh, but as far as how it's going to go from here, I have to wait a week. I'll have my blood drawn next week. It'll go. So why do you have to wait? What because the... the the blood thinners have an effect on your blood that will influence the results of the testing that I'm going to get. So I got to make okay. sure my blood is free from all the thinners before they test it. So I got to oh. wait a week. They'll they'll draw my blood next week, and then on March 28th. Uh, presumably I'll get the results of the testing before that, but I'll go talk with a doctor on uh, a hematology specialist on March 28th. I did find your theory the, today compelling. Well, uh, we'll find out unless they can show me I have a genetic factor. Yeah. My theory is I got a weird infection in my finger when we were moving last spring. This is like end of May and my, the tip of my finger turned, it turned into like a bright red bulb. And then I had like traveling redness and pain all the way down to the elbow. And I got anti antibiotics for that. Antibiotics, antibiotics. What's your preferred pronunciation? Anyway, Both are correct. I got antibiotics and that seemed to, to make it go away. But, um, but my theory and the, the, I've told all the doctors about this. None of them seem particularly interested in investigating that. They haven't told me, no, it's not that, but they don't seem particularly interested in it. But when you have a blood infection or you have you have damage to the internals of your blood vessels, potentially in that way, that can cause clotting. And I know I'm talking about an injury or an infection that started in the finger and was limited to my left arm. And what happened with the DVT was my right leg. But if you have blood that is primed to clot, apparently that can the most likely place for that is in your lower leg, which is where it happened for me. So if it's not a yes, genetic yeah. factor that they can show me, I'm, I think it was that infection that, well, is there's, you know, it. I love to do medical research. So instead of preparing for today's show, I like research just for like an hour pointlessly, but there is a lot of evidence that if you get a strep or a staph infection, um, in any of your extremities, that this is much more likely to happen. So I don't know why these doctors are like, no, -uh. it's like, well, for the same reason they told me it wasn't a DVT when I went there in the first place. And I'm like, no, but yeah. it is. I, I, I trust me. It is. No, no, no. Anyway, so I'll keep you posted. But I, of course, I appreciate everyone's well wishing. And I, I, I offer this not to bore you, but just to keep everyone uh, aware of what's going on with that. And I will have more answers at the end of the month. Now, um, on this show, of course, we've been following two stories closely, um, among others. But there's the trial of Hannah Gutierrez Reed, the rust set armor and the Alec Baldwin shooting. And of course, as we'll get to later in the show, the Fannie Willis disqualification challenge in the Trump racketeering case in Georgia. Both you of those. You know how excited I was when I thought this was Fannie Willis. I mean, it's still funny in its actual context, <laughs> which is also relevant to the show and current. True. Both of those stories collided into what was an improperly characterized claim. Still funny, though. This week, video was circulating on Twitter claiming that, that during the Fannie Willis disqualification hearings, it was revealed that she gave her phone the device name Gorilla Grip Pussy Pal. Oh, God, I didn't think you were going to say it. It's Gorilla Grip P Word Pal. Supposedly, <laughs> as described by a witness. What's the owner name of this phone? Um, the, the name that would appear on, say, a Bluetooth device is found on line uh, 32, which is uh, Gorilla Grip Pussy Pal. Okay. That guy's like, this is going to go viral. Fuck. I know. <laughs> uh, 40 million people are going to watch me say this. They probably have now. <laughs> um, how many gamer tags, how many screen names are now Gorilla Grip Pussy Pal? There's probably Change. a from four doors, more horrors. <laughs> yeah, that was that was yesteryear's preferred yep. option. Um, yeah, while funny, of course, the clip has nothing to do with Fannie Willis. It has everything to do with Hannah Gutierrez Reed. The witness <laughs> is Jason Hawks, uh, a digital information expert. He was answering questions from the prosecution about texts from the phone of Hannah Gutierrez Reed, and she is the one who supposedly named her phone Gorilla Grip P Word Pal. Now, I I don't. As far as I've seen, there's no explanation for that choice yet. Perhaps Hannah will take the stand in her own defense and explain what is now the second most important thing or the second most interesting thing in the case. The first is still, uh, how did that live ammunition? Get on the set? 
but after you're done explaining that yeah what's what's the because i don't i don't do i want to invite this conversation i don't really know what that means really i understand the concept of a gorilla grip it's a strong grip right yeah i understand I you got it then buddy okay i, think, I understand I think you're there yeah. i understand the concept of of the p word female genitalia and pal so is she just saying i'm a friend who has a strong grip on female genitals what what is you you did it that's it okay i just if you it need a friend she has, who will, a, she has strong vaginal muscles okay oh that's what it means for the love of god this is like my oh. moment where i where i didn't get the donald duck joke until <laughs> i i'm old enough now that i need clarification it means that that um that itself has grip strength not her hand but that itself has grip strength yeah she's talking about the wonder of her box got it the reason that this wasn't it was it's not as funny now that it's hannah gutierrez reed because i thought that there was like a like a racial element to this too like a self defacing racial element when it was fanny willis and it made me kind of like her <laughs> <laughs> and then and then i found out no <laughs> no, it's uh, Hannah Gutierrez Reed is is racist for the reference, I would assume. Anyway. OK, another story uh, about. Uh, did, well, I, I shouldn't. I don't know what sort of degeneracy is involved in this nickname, but there's definitely degeneracy in this story. And I, 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 this story is just hilarious because it, it combines all the degeneracy and the backwardness of our time all together. I think the only thing that's missing from this story is illegal immigrants, but they haven't really identified who's behind this. So it's definitely possible that illegal immigrants are behind this, too, which will just complete the story. But they usually are in the Hollywood Hills. A real estate agent named Emily Randall Smith is selling a 9000 square foot mansion. And she and her husband were away for the holidays for a few weeks when they came back to the neighborhood to prep this mansion for an open house. They found, wow, uh, someone has has cut the lockbox. And we can't get in. And the doors have been relocked with bike locks, like cables wrapped around the door handles. And so her husband peeks around through the windows and notices there's just a guy sleeping in the bed inside. Rather than trying to make some fight out of it, they called police. Police investigated. They discovered not just unauthorized tenants, but the guy had taken over the house and drawn up fake lease agreements to charge a bunch of OnlyFans content creators rent. He was charging them $2,000 a month just for, I presume, a room, something like a seven-bedroom house. So this guy, I don't know how many OnlyFans creators he had in there, but let's say he had five. He's pr he's <laughs> trying to rake in like $10,000 a month in renting out a house that isn't his. He just went in there and drew up fake lease agreements to get these yeah. OnlyFans checks. That motherfucker's an entrepreneur. I don't care it's about <laughs> so <laughs> property rights. Good for him. <laughs> Anyway, the, this these real the, this real estate agent and her husband they leave for a couple of weeks. They come back to find out some kind of bizarre OnlyFans pimp has taken over the property that they're managing. Here is uh, some video on the story. Move out day for a squatter in the Hollywood Hills. Police helping with suitcases as LAPD kicks out a woman living in a vacant house, turning it back over to the shocked realtors. She had a fake lease agreement. And she had told us she was an OnlyFans model that she did for work and she was doing that at the house. That woman said she was creating OnlyFans content in this 9,000 square foot Hollywood Hills mansion in a room she rented for $2,000 a month from a guy who was definitely not the owner, saying she was one of four or five people doing the same. We came to the house to open it and the lockbox was cut off. He peeked in one of the windows and there was a guy laying on the bed. The couple calling police. The owner didn't want to knock down the door, so police returning later that night when the OnlyFans model answered authorities kicking her out the realtors securing the property the house was trash there was dog poop and pee all over the house weed smell alcohol that stuff so they were partying i, I guess i don't understand like why you would spend two thousand dollars a month like were they living there that didn't seem clear i i interpreted that to mean they're living there and working out of the house you know oh. air quotes working at producing oh, okay. only fans content I thought um, that they were just going there like it was their studio. I don't, I don't know, but I under when I hear that they've rented it out, I guess I just assume that they're they're living there, that they're sleeping there. Uh, 
This is reporting from last weekend, and in KTLA it says, as of Monday, no one is believed to have been arrested in connection <laughs> with the case, which is just hilarious. Like, what do you mean no one's been arrested? This is breaking and entering. This is trespassing. There's fraudulent lease agreements. This guy's cashing in on property that he doesn't own. Um, so I don't know what what is behind that. Maybe police. Uh, it's possible they have arrested some people. L.A. Times reports it in a different way. Police have not provided any updates about arrests, so that doesn't say no arrests. But if they if there have been arrests, they're not describing them. Uh, and and I don't know if this has anything to do with how squatters are handled legally in California too, because if squatters are there for I forget what the time threshold is, but if you have squatters in your property, you can't just remove them immediately, depending no. on if they've lived there for a little while. You have to actually give them a three day notice to leave. And then if they don't leave, you have to take them to court. You can't just boot their asses out. Uh, and you can't just have oh, cops go in and arrest people. I've dealt with so, squatters before. People have no idea how few rights landlords have. And that's was that in Idaho, too? It wasn't even in like yes, Washington. It was or in something. Idaho. It took like months to get these people off of our property. Ugh. Well, uh, this story um, happened at the start of the year, and I know several in the audience uh, have have mentioned it, and I didn't know much about it, and then you texted me about this week, so I wanted to give a little bit of time to it because a guy in the UK is now in prison for a couple of years for what does making downloadable stickers about how maybe immigration is not not that great. Yeah, it's Sam Malia. It's Laura Towler's husband. Um, I know Laura Towler. I've never met her husband, but from all accounts, he's a, not that this even matters, but he's a super nice guy, like really nice, upstanding citizen. This is shocking even for the UK, but what he had done was much like the sticker campaign that our audience was doing a few years ago. Do you remember that? Well, I know there has been, uh, yeah, there's, I know some of that happened. I know there's been talk of doing it more. And of course, like well beyond our audience, there was the it's okay to be white sticker campaign mm -hmm. and all like people have been doing this in the U S context for a long, yeah. long time. Yeah. Yeah. So he had um, an archive of 300 or so stickers that people were printing off and putting in various places in the UK. And I think in, in other countries um, and they raided his home and they found, Oh no, a book by Oswald Mosley <laughs> and then a poster of Hitler <laughs> I and love some Nazi stuff. It's like, who cares? <laughs> They found a poster of Hitler on his wall, okay? And that that yeah. justifies the raid of his home and the se the separation of this family. So asinine. Just, At this point, who amongst us does not have a poster of Hitler? In <laughs> well, when we watched American History X, I said, that's bullshit. Nobody has a bedroom like that. Maybe this guy actually has no, a bedroom like no, that. No, he doesn't. Um, not that no, it matters. But, I mean, I, I don't care if he does. That's, that's you know, I'm sure you agree. But I mean, that that's not the point. It's like whatever you have in your own home, you're allowed to have in your own home unless of course it's illegal, and whatever. Here's an example absurd. of it's so absurd of the stickers as reported by the guardian, which, you know, uh, as far as I understand the guardian, they would be a, 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 an outlet inclined to maximize this guy's offenses. So whatever the worst things he did, they're going to, they're going to report on that. Indeed. The, uh, the headline here is UK man with Hitler picture in home. You sticker. So they, they make the Hitler picture like the headline. Um, but what were the stickers? Well, here's the worst ones that they could, that they could, print uh reject white guilt national oh, no. nationalism is nurture we will be a minority in our homeland by 2066 i mean that that's bored that's not even like advocacy that's like factual tolerance <laughs> is a virtue oh that was one too okay yeah they seek conquest not asylum mass immigration is white genocide it's all factual stuff and the thing that's most maddening is that during the trial the prosecution admitted that the language was not unlawful um, and during the trial, they also said it does not matter if the content of the stickers is true. It's not well, a defense. I, it's like, how on earth is that? Maybe if he encouraged people to stick stuff on property that isn't his, there's like the lowest level. I don't, vandalism would be too strong a word, but you get what I mean? Like that, that's the, the harshest I could possibly envision treating such a case, which in reality, the actual resolution here is, Hey, um, that, you know, that's not your property. So don't put stickers on it. Okay. I won't. That's how you solve this. Well, he's being held um, accountable for all of the people that put stickers on private property. So that's what they're, he, so it's not the content of the speech. They're, they're hammering him with two years of prison for supposed vandalism premises. That's the publishing idea. or distributing material intending to stir up racial hatred. Oh, so, okay. So it is the content then. Yes. But I think most of it was encouraging or assisting the commission of the offense 
of racially aggravated criminal damage. It's like putting a <laughs> sticker on something is not criminal damage. Okay. And, and again, not that anybody deserves prison time for this, but I will emphasize, and you pointed out to me, this guy, it, does he have a newborn now or his wife is about to give birth? Laura Towler is um, due in April with their second kid. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to split up. Fa- we're going to take dad away. We're going to split up the family. And this fucking judge has let off people uh, that were child rapists or like reduced sentences for child rapists and everything. It's just, it's just asinine. I was reading, I actually retweeted it. Uh, blondes underscore tweets, by the way, um, that a guy uh, raped like a nine year old and he got 180 hours of community service. But like, Sam Malia, some some grave threat to the future of the UK. It's just so asinine. I this is bad even even for the UK. Two years in jail. I hope that he can get a sentence reduced. This is just an absolute outrage. Um, if you want to help them out, they do have a give send go. It's give send go.com slash Sam Malia. I think we have it up on the screen right now. I didn't, but I just grabbed it. Well, but, good. It looks like they've raised uh, fifty thousand pounds for his, you know, whatever legal defense he may have. I don't know if there's an appeal. I don't know how it works there. But how can they do this though? I mean, are they never worried that the shoe is going to be on the other foot and we're going to exercise the precedent that they've set forth in any of our countries? Uh, no. Or, they, they, why they assume that they will exercise power for all time? Um, <laughs> that's retarded and, and short sighted because I, everyone's going to remember stuff like this. And then when we regain power, we're going to just act with impunity. At least I hope uh, things like this tend to, I know it's wildly unjust for now. Of course, uh, justice tends to be restored through one means or another eventually. And if you keep treating people like this, uh, yeah, it, that, that, uh, pendulum is going to swing back. And if it swings back rather aggressively, um, I won't be sorry for the people who pulled it the other direction aggressively in the first place. So it's just yeah. incredible to watch even white people be like, Oh, like dunking on this guy. Cause he's a white nationalist. It's like, don't you realize the broader implications of this? And I would like to say that this is UK nonsense, but we're going to talk about January 6th in a little bit. Um, how far behind as a country are we really people well, like, put our guns? It's like, I don't know, man. I don't know if that's going to protect us. From I'd rather have them than, than not, but the point sure. that you sure, need yeah. to have. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 as, as with crime committed with guns, it depends on the operator of the firearm. You know, the tool is only as useful as the person wielding it. And that's not me calling for violence. It's just me saying that, that even the firearm is not a substitute for bravery and for standing up for what's right. A gun can't do that on its own. Uh, that takes, Men of conviction, men of moral fortitude. And I think we're short on those in many ways. Poor Laura. Well, Godspeed to her and family. Poor Sam, man. I just, I can't, it's so preposterous to split up a family over something like this. Yeah, they don't but, care because they're splitting up a white family. Right. And well, yeah, it's all for the cause then, I guess. Um, all right. Well, let's get into uh, the exciting news, which is Super Tuesday is upon us. Well, it's like 48 hours away at least, but uh, actually we have some results from primaries uh, yesterday before we get into Super Tuesday. Uh, Trump easily beat Nikki Haley in Michigan. I guess, (laughs) is Michigan one of those caucus and primary states? Because they voted on Tuesday too. That is so stupid. I I don't really understand that, what's going on there, but uh, uh, Trump easily beat, uh, uh, well, there's the vote, there's the vote on Tuesday. Maybe I'm confused. Anyway, Trump beats Haley in Michigan. Bottom line. That's what happened this week. Um, Yesterday, he also won the Iowa and Missouri caucuses. And uh, and uh, in fact, yesterday, Trump earned every delegate at stake yesterday, all 244. Nikki Haley got zero yesterday. And that brings us to Super Tuesday. 16 more states will hold primaries. Uh day after tomorrow, March 5th. The latest polling shows Nikki Haley is behind in all of them. The closest state I see isn't even close. Uh, it's it, in Utah here. You've got Trump at 49%, Nikki Haley at 22. It's a 27 point gap. Virginia, depending on how you, depending on how you decide the uh, polling population, you get a different answer. Haley Haley reduced Trump's lead to single digits in a February Institute for Policy and Opinion research poll, 51 to 43 percent. 
but get a lot of how different this result is. However, when the survey is reduced to those who self-report as Republicans instead of likely GOP primary voters, again, how many people are likely GOP primary voters who are not necessarily interested in supporting the Republican candidate in November? More on that in a moment. When you say people who self-report as Republicans, Trump's, Trump's lead dramatically expands to 75% for Trump, 15% for Haley. Mm. That's a very drastic shift. So what's what's driving that? Again, that's just that's just Virginia. That's one state. But pray tell what is driving that? Well, it's 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 yet more evidence, of course, that Nikki Haley voters aren't even real. And of course, I thought they were purely fictitious, which they are a figment of many people's imagination. But the reality is that many of them are spiteful Democrats who have nothing better to do. In fact, they've marked this day on their calendar for months. The day I get to vote against Trump, I can't wait. And they go out and they vote against Trump. And that's what Nikki Haley benefits from. I was talking about this on my Wednesday show, and um, I discussed an exit poll that showed from last Saturday's South Carolina primary. uh, That exit poll showed 40% of Nikki Haley voters in her home state, South Carolina, voted Biden in 2020. So, do we think that these people have changed their mind and they're leaving Biden and they and they still hate Trump or what? Or are they just people who hate Trump? They're driven in life to hate Trump and this is an opportunity for them to hate Trump. So they go and vote Nikki Haley. Outside of South Carolina, it looks like that's actually an underestimation because maybe maybe Nikki Haley does have some legitimate support in her home state. But according to the recently released New York Times Siena poll, a near majority of Ms. Haley's supporters, 48 percent, say they voted Biden in the last election instead of Mr. Trump. Now, I'm sure that some of these people are good faith independents like, oh, I hate Trump. I voted for Biden in 2020 because I hate Trump. But Biden's been so terrible that I can't support him anymore. But I also don't like Trump. So I'm going to Nikki Haley. I'm sure those people are real. But I don't know. I mean, who do you think is the bigger population, those good faith independents or the the people who hate Trump so much that they're voting Nikki Haley out of spite? Definitely the good faith independents. I could I could listen to the argument I mean, people change. People bounce back and forth between parties all the time. But it does it it does look a lot like Nikki Haley's support is. If not mostly uh, a sizable portion of it is fake. It's people who have no intent of supporting her. In November, they're just here to hate Trump. So when is Nikki Haley going to quit? That's the big question. I don't know. She's for a while now been saying never. She's going to she's going to carry on through every single vote. Well, this morning on Meet the Press, uh, she actually changed her language some. Now she's saying she's going to keep going as long as voters and donors are showing their support. Are you prepared to stay in this through the convention? Is that your plan? If the people want to see me go forward, they'll show it. They'll show it in their votes. They'll show it in their donations. They'll show it in the fact that they want us to continue to go forward. No, because uh, nobody wants you to go forward. And yet here you are still doing the thing. Nobody wants you to go forward for authentic reasons of supporting you, at least. They they want you to carry on for, you know, the, the, the... Useful, the momentary usefulness of bashing Trump, I guess. But uh, she's also losing a lot of big money supporters. The 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 Koch brothers pack. They announced they're not going to be spending money on her behalf this week. Um, when when she runs out of money, when she's when she's squatting to produce OnlyFans content because she's that poor. Oh my god! <laughs> what then a maybe world. She, then maybe she'll quit. Uh, now, but, but no, I don't know. I'm I'm. Cautiously optimistic, we might see a Nikki Haley concession this week, uh, but she ha- she has been consent uh, or content rather to suffer tremendous embarrassment. So maybe she'll carry on in the embarrassment further. Uh, the other thing lingering for Super Tuesday is where in the hell is that Supreme Court decision about Colorado? Well, uh, Colorado because Colorado will vote Tuesday. It's a Super Tuesday state. It looks like that's coming out tomorrow. Remember, this is the case where the Colorado State Supreme Court said Trump's not eligible to be on the ballot because of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, the insurrection clause. He's an insurrectionist. You can't vote for him. And then the Supreme Court heard that case. 
then the the in the meantime the the main secretary of state followed too Maine also votes on Tuesday just this week there was an Illinois judge that said the same Trump is disqualified he's an insurrectionist Illinois vote, votes on March 19th as a practical matter all of these decisions are paused they're not yet enforced because um one way or another they're they're all dependent on what the supreme court says in this decision so unless the supreme court comes out tomorrow and says against all predictions uh colorado was right you can go ahead and delete trump off the ballot anytime you like won't happen then yeah this is going to be a, a moot point and he'll be on the ballot in all these states and the, this this desperate effort to exclude him will be will be over uh but we're going to get the it sounds like 10 a.m. tomorrow we're going to get try again we're going to get the answer to that question um, and that's because the court has issued it's going to issue or has um, indicated it's going to issue rulings tomorrow. So if they say, hey, we got rulings come out, coming out tomorrow and it's like some irrelevant nonsense that has nothing to do with Super Tuesday. Oh, they wouldn't. I don't think so. That'd be funny, though. The only question, too, it, it's if I was betting, I would bet that this comes out as a 9-0 decision. Um, but the only person during the hearing, during the arguments who seemed to be a little bit more in the disqualification side. Even Jumanji Brown Jackson was like, this is bullshit. Um, but Sonia Sotomayor was asking questions that seemed slanted toward the disqualification. And then she realized, don't you do it. Nobody agreed with her. And she shut the hell up for the rest of the hearing. Is wow, she going to do really it? really what you want in a Supreme court justice, somebody that won't stand on their own principles. Well, um, I don't know. Nobody backhanded her and she still shut up. So I appreciate that. That's true. Yeah, but you don't want that in a Supreme Court justice. You want somebody that'll be like, this is what I believe. This is what I believe is the interpretation of the Constitution. I don't care. Is she's she's bowing to social pressure. Not that she shouldn't, but you know, this is the consequence of having women in this position. Uh, yeah, well, we'll see. We'll see how, she, how much she bows when this comes out tomorrow. If there's some, if it's 8-1 and there's one of those classically kooky Sotomayor dissents i'm going to read that first i, I mean i know the, the the rest of the court the majority will have like five or six different arguments they could take on and they'll probably just they'll 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 pick they'll pick one of the easier ones uh and they'll just go with that sony sotomayor's argument that actually all states can have this sort of weird individual veto on who's ballot eligible mm -hmm. um I, I i will read that that'll be fun speaking of the supreme court though uh on wednesday the court agreed to hear Trump's claim of presidential immunity in the special counsel Jack Smith January 6th case. Recall Jack Smith is saying that Trump's actions leading up to and on January 6th were part of a conspiracy against rights that by trying to um, trying to have Congress uh, delay the certification of the vote and investigate voting irregularities further that he was actually denying you of your constitutional right to have your vote counted. That is the core of the legal theory here. In addition to obstruction and other stuff tacked on. Uh, now a key part of Trump's defense is his claim of presidential immunity that because his actions up to and on January 6th were part of his official capacity as president. That's the argument, not just something he did on his own personal time, but part of his official capacity as president, he can't be prosecuted for them because generally speaking, we don't do that to presidents. If, if the president, um, you know, the president invades a country and it was a bad policy decision, we don't prosecute him for that. Even if it was a terrible decision, and it had tremendous consequences. See past presidents who invaded countries and paid no legal price for it whatsoever. Uh, that's the idea that when you're acting in your official capacity, you, you enjoy immunity from prosecution. And Trump is arguing that. Now, the appeals court the, the, has disagreed. Uh, and that's why this is going to the Supreme Court now. The appeals court decided against Trump, said he can be prosecuted for his January 6th actions. And so now the Supreme Court has agreed to hear just that question. So to be clear, the Supreme Court is not taking the totality of Jack Smith's case that Trump denied you your constitutional right to vote on January 6th. They're just taking the question of uh, is Trump's behavior that is allegedly criminal in this case, is that protected by presidential immunity or can he be prosecuted for that conduct? That's the only question that the Supreme Court will take for now. 
uh, is, the specific language the court offered in granting um, cert to hear the case is, quote, whether and if so, to what extent does a former president enjoy presidential immunity from criminal prosecution for conduct alleged to involve official acts during his tenure in office? So even if the court decides against Trump in this case, it doesn't mean he's convicted or something. It just means the prosecution at the trial court can continue. But of course, can continue later means significant delay now. And in the context of an upcoming election, that matters quite a lot because the court isn't even going to hear the arguments until April 22nd. Right. And so they won't decide on the question until probably the end of June, maybe a little earlier than that, but sometime around there. All of that means that that a trial before the election is very unlikely. And of course, uh, if Trump were to win the election, he could either pardon himself or if there is a legal challenge to his ability to self-pardon, because not everyone agrees that you can do that, he could just direct his Justice Department to drop the case because he's not going to be convicted before he's elected in that case. Um, so... Uh, as um, MSNBC's legal analyst Andrew Weissman of Mueller investigation fame said this week, Jack Smith's case is now on life support because this trial is not going to happen before Election Day. Yes, of course, I think ultimately they will not grant immunity in this case, but they have given him the win because the D.C. case let's just face it, is on life support now. It is imp really, really hard to figure out how this case gets to trial before the election. And I think that's the, the end result of what they did here. So uh, this this case is, is severely damaged. And the idea yeah. that it's going to get Trump convicted before Election Day, that's, that's pretty much out the window. Uh, but elsewhere on MSNBC, analyst Ellie Mistel, who as I mentioned at the top of the show, was recently accurately described as looking like Don King ate another Don King. He says the Supreme Court even hearing this argument, this immunity challenge, shows that they're a corrupt institution who must be fundamentally changed. What it says is that they are cor 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 corrupted political actors who act in bad faith. And at some point, people in the media, people at home, and people sitting in the White House have to stop pretending that the Supreme Court is some kind of benign, trying to do its best institution, and start to realize that there are six Republicans, not conservatives, Republicans on the Supreme Court who view it as their job to help the Republican Party. And until we do something about that, until we take away that power, until we draw the line on them there, they will continue to do this. They will help Trump. They will take away abortion rights. They will end affirmative action. They will liberalize gun rights. They will do all of it until we stop them. And somebody, somebody needs to start listening in the higher echelons of the Democratic Party because we will keep losing every day. We allow these six Republicans in robes to rule over all of us. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there. Okay. Uh, he's admitting that the Supreme Court has power beyond what they should, for sure. Yeah, it's like, go on. I'm listening. I'm listening, yeah. But you know. You're telling me we should, we should strip them of their power to legislate from the bench? Wow. Wow. Hmm, interesting idea there. And, and also, he's openly saying that everybody on the Supreme Court should be liberal. I guess. Yeah, like, it, you... Yeah. Or if he was going to say, if you're conservative, you can't do it while also helping Republican politicians. But yeah, that the equal application of the law means sometimes you benefit, sometimes you don't. Like the idea that that one party could never benefit in disputes that are settled by the court. I mean, what's the point of having the court then? There's nothing to adjudicate. Those guys are bad. They lose. Yeah. What's he going to, we got to do something about it. He's going to eat a Supreme court sandwich with gravy <laughs> if they don't do exactly what he says, this guy. But it, I, I want to emphasize he's mad that they agreed to hear the challenge. Okay. Not that they yeah. decided in Trump's favor that they agreed to have a hearing and issue a decision later. And he's going to say, well, yeah, but, but that's, um, you know, that, that goes, that, that, 
uh, helps Trump, obviously, because it's a delay in in the case. Well, that's that's what due process does. If you don't yeah. like that, it takes a while to evaluate an unprecedented prosecution, by the way, about which there are unsettled legal questions. If you don't like that, it takes a minute to resolve that. You're just not a fan of due process itself. Do you think he understands? Oh, uh, is he stupid or evil? Yeah, good question. Uh, I, I guess and, they're not mutually exclusive. And the, the the irony too is he's the Supreme Court is going to decide against Trump in this case. Mm-hmm. You can bet on that. They're going to say he's not immune from prosecution. It's going to have the effect of a delay of a couple months, but they're not going to decide in Trump's favor. And and if you're saying that they can't evaluate that question because the tri- the trial must happen on a timeline that I approve of for political reasons so that I can have him convicted before the election because that's my preferred political outcome. I have news for you. It's not everyone else who's politically motivated, dude. That would be you. That'd be you. And uh, to your point on, on this complaint about Supreme Court power. Okay. How did the Supreme Court get such centralized power? Because like you, I agree. Maybe it shouldn't be able to set national policy in this way. In fact, I don't think it should in pretty much all contexts. I think it should resolve dis- disputes that are part of federal jurisdiction, but there's lots of stuff that ain't in the original constitutional design. In fact, most things aren't. But yeah, wouldn't it be great? I agree. Wouldn't it be great if we had, un- if we if we didn't have these unelected lawyers setting this national policy all the time. But what changed that was a progressive agenda and specifically a progressive agenda through the magical 14th amendment that made everything a constitutional right, whatever you want. It's Oprah with constitutional rights. You get a constitutional right. You get a constitutional right because it's through the magic of the penumbras of substantive due process. So in the irony of him talking about abortion while doing that, it's like they didn't take away anyone's abortion. What are you talking about? You are saying you want them to surrender power. They literally surrendered power by overturning Roe versus Wade. They sent it back to the states. But guess what? You're mad about that, actually. In that case, you want the power centralized. Of course, the answer is what we all know it is. It, it's not a matter of the principles of centralized or decentralized power or the rule of law or any of that stuff. It's, it's just I want centralized power that does the stuff that I want done. <laughs> this, my own political yeah. preferences. If this got, if the Supreme Court said tomorrow, no, we got it wrong. Roe v. Wade is back. You think he's complaining about Supreme Court power anymore? Of course not. If he, if they said uh, Second Amendment means nothing, your guns are banned. I, I doubt he cares about that. If they rule tomorrow morning, Trump is banned from the ballot in all 50 states. <laughs> you think Ali Mistel is going to be complaining about centralized Supreme Court power? All the, it's complaining about institutions when you lose. But then when you win, they must be revered and any critic of them is a, is an enemy to the republic. It's 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 yeah, so yeah, yeah. blatantly snaky behavior. But why are they so confident that the Overton window isn't going to shift? Uh how, the Overton window in what way? That we're not going to reach critical mass and then regain power of institutions, then use it, use their precedent to um, destroy all of all of their lives. I don't like, know. They, they seem very confident that that's never going to happen. Why? Some might say foresight is a sign of intelligence. I don't know. I, I'm, I, we need to be careful about attributing uh, stupidity when malice should be. Attributed. Oh, you can be. Dumb. And I think that you can be dumb and evil. Yeah, but I, th- but that, that, that they have to have considered. Maybe that's why they freak out every time like this a Sam Malia thing. Maybe that's why they freak out every time it seems like the Overton window is shifting in the culture and overcompensate. Uh, yeah, well, it, it's all um, it all comes down to centralized control to achieve the policy ends they prefer. Uh, and I would assume that's part of it, too. Like You, you control speech, you control acceptable opinions. Uh, yeah, it's all of those things. If this Supreme Court says tomorrow hate speech is banned, you can't critique Fat black guys like Ellie Mistel anymore because that's hate speech. <laughs> yeah. uh, great. He loves it. That's awesome. If, you, if this stream gets banned under that new precedent. Great. I love it. But he's all in, in any other context. He's about decentralized power and the protection of rights. As long as. Totally. You know, totally. Whatever. I it's worry, just, though, that we if we ever get power back, that we'll just wield it in a lawful and benevolent way. In which <sighs> case we always lose, don't we? 
Well, I <laughs> at this point, it's like, I don't know. It's like, that's what I, I want our society ruled in a lawful and benevolent way. That's the, that's the goal. Even though I hate everything this guy is saying, I yeah, want but him people, to be they're, they're They need to be They're like Muslims that need to be ruled with an iron fist. These are people that need to be governed in a certain kind of way. And that way is, um, the, well, how do I say this? It's with some force. Just, they just one kick they in the nuts. It. Can we just kick him in the nuts once and yeah. say, have you learned your lesson? All right. Handshake. I don't, I don't we'll think that's going to we'll do call it. it good. I, I, I think we're going to need a little bit more than that. God, dude. You know who else needs a kick in the nuts? <laughs> no, I don't know. Uh, pretty much everyone involved with Fannie Willis in in uh, Georgia. If, if the Trump January 6th case is, is on life support, as we heard Weissman say, the Fannie Willis case in Georgia might be dead. And uh, of course, we've been following this case for weeks. It just keeps getting better and better the more Fannie Willis and her boyfriend prosecutor, Nathan Wade, keep Don't lying. you mean worse and worse? <laughs> and all oh, the entertainment value is, is sky high. I mean, worse and worse for them, yeah. but better and better for me as, <laughs> as a viewer, because it's hilarious. Now it shouldn't be funny that these corrupt people have been defrauding the taxpayer to uh, prosecute their political opponent to try to mess with his election. I mean, this is, this is also evil stuff. I mean, th this is enemy of the country type stuff. So I shouldn't treat it as a joke because it's actually about as serious as it gets. And a serious country, you know, we would, um, the, the TNF would be, uh, would be the solution here. Uh, cause she's earned it, but you know, in this case we'll settle for disqualification, which is probably what's going to happen. Although there are maybe a few, few points to consider, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, a few points of caution on the disqualification, that is. But um, as a reminder on what, what's happened so far in the case, I'll be brief since I've talked about this case so much. But so far, the evidence pretty conclusively shows that Fannie Willis, the Fulton County DA, hired her then married boyfriend to prosecute Trump and paid him the better part of a million dollars in public money that the couple then used to take vacations together, among other luxuries. And their defense is a few things. One, their romance didn't start until after she hired him, even though there's now witness testimony and phone data to show that she did. And then the other defense is like, oh, it's a black thing to carry, to keep like a cookie jar full of 10 grand. And I, I, I reimbursed him for all those costs that he paid for me. You know, there's no record of any of this. Okay. That's what we're going with. But I discussed this development it's on my a Wednesday black show. black thing to have 10 grand? In cash, just like sitting in your house. That's what her dad said. He literally said no, that no, on the stand. No, I know. I was yeah. making a joke about black people being poor. But oh, oh, I see. Ha <laughs> 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 ha. <Okay>. Sorry, <laughs> the, the hate speech I escaped I love me. explaining my jokes. It makes me so funny. <laughs> there's, there's another. There's another joke there. I'm just going to leave it on the table. <laughs> Certain industries are very lucrative. How about that? Whatever. Um, okay. I discussed this development on my Wednesday show a little bit, but I, I want to go through it here just so we can discuss it too. But um, this week, Nathan Wade's former lawyer in his divorce case, he took the stand on Tuesday. There was some dispute about whether he was protected by attorney client privilege or not. He played dumb and he, he's like, Oh, I don't know anything. Supposedly he was going to be the star witness for the Trump lawyers. And he was going to say, that he knew for sure that they were dating before Fannie Willis hired him. Mm -hmm. Fannie Willis hired Nathan Wade. And he takes the stand and he, he acts like he knows nothing. And then they confront him on text messages that he had sent to Ashley Merchant, who's the Trump co-defendant lawyer who broke this whole thing open. So, well, what do you mean when you said absolutely? When I, when I said, did they start dating before she hired him? You said absolutely. His response is something to the effect of, well, it was speculative. I didn't know for sure. It was speculative. So this guy acts like he knows nothing. He plays dumb and his testimony is, is just a dot. It doesn't really mean anything because he doesn't really say anything. Well, uh, then Megan Kelly through her friend, Phil, uh, Holloway got a hold of the texts. And these are texts that, that Terrence Bradley, Nathan Wade's former divorce, uh, divorce lawyer sent to Ashley Merchant, basically tipping her off to this entire story. And he, in these texts, he definitely is not just speculating. He knows a lot. Uh, he's telling Ashley Merchant, the Trump co-defendant lawyer, man, they took a ton of trips together, Texas, Napa, Florida. They went all over. Uh, Ashley Merchant says why she would hire him is insane. Bradley agrees. Yes. Oh, I know. 
<laughs> Merchant says, hey, do you think it, it started before she hired him? Absolutely. Which the Fannie Willis lawyers tried to say on Friday. Well, that shows he's speculating. Do you think? Well, yeah, but then you have the next text with specific knowledge. It started when she left the DA's office and was a judge in South Fulton. That's not like, Ooh. I think that's, I know. Yeah. And then later she says she's crafting up her legal documents. She said, hey, would it be accurate to say that they met when they were both serving as magistrate judges and their romantic relationship started then? He says, oh, no, no, no. municipal court. But you can't put that in there because then they're going to know that I'm the source because <laughs> nobody knows that except for me. So this speculation bullshit, he knew 100%. And then he closes the conversation, one of the conversations, happy hunting, lol, like encouraging her to go get this guy. That guy being Nathan Wade, which means he knows. So why would Terrence Bradley kind of reverse on the stand? Presumably um, for the same reason he didn't want to be outed when he was texting Ashley Merchant. He didn't want to be known as the source, whether that means Willis and Wade would punish him or are going to punish him or he separated from Nathan Wade. Uh, there was some accusation of sexual harassment. So maybe he's got his own skeletons to hide. He doesn't want to be investigated himself. So right. now that he's actually outed as the source, he's like, I'm just going to not say anything. But he borderline perjured himself on the stand say, saying, I don't know, or I can't recall, or I was, Why? Like, I, I guess he didn't think, I, I don't really understand because maybe he didn't think that these texts would be revealed, but one of the lawyers grilling him is Ashley Merchant, who obviously has the texts that he sent to her. Yeah. So I don't really know what he's thinking other than like. Do you think he was being blackmailed? Me? I don't know. I can't I can't really explain the behavior. I don't understand why somebody would perjure themselves over something like this unless there was something else at play no. here. The reason I bring all of that up, and I know that's a little bit of repetition from my Wednesday show. So for listeners of that show, sorry for that. But uh, I, I bring all that up to get to this point. Uh, Megan Kelly got fed those texts from another lawyer named Phil Holloway. And Phil Holloway, whatever his source, has been on top of a lot of interesting information in this disqualification case. And he tweeted on uh, last Wednesday, whoa boy, if what I was just told about comes to pass, it's going to get really interesting in Fulton County. So far, everything this source has had, uh, has said has been spot on. And then he tweeted on Friday, looking at Monday or Tuesday at the latest to, uh, to announce news on this particular update quote, tweeting that last tweet. So, you know, that's what he's talking about. So there might be still more damaging information coming out from a guy who was behind this information here, which is hugely consequential in this case. And as we'll get to in a moment, the judge might not even be considering all of those text messages because they might just, that might be cherry on top stuff that he doesn't even care about. It's like, right. You've convinced me. Uh, that's I, I was convinced before all this, in fact, but there was a, <laughs> now, I'm not going to characterize Fannie Willis's entire defense as this moment. But a lot of legal analysts I've listened to and respect seem to think that this guy had a tough time. You decide how representative this is or not. He gets up there and he's making closing arguments for uh, on behalf of Fannie Willis and why she shouldn't be disqualified. And he makes the mistake of calling her Miss Wade. Uh, there's a lot of high profile prosecutions. If Miss Wade's or excuse me, Miss Willis's ultimate goal by hiring Mr. Wade was for her financial benefit, then she would put Mr. Wade on every single one of those cases. Man, she wishes, right? <laughs> Which is kind of a silly argument too. Like, well, we know that they weren't trying to financially benefit here because they had many other opportunities in which they could have financially benefited. Well, you are, I mean, you're, you're one man. You can't work every case on the planet. It does seem odd that they picked a guy with no prosecutorial, at least felony prosecutorial experience to take on the biggest high profile case because of, I mean, it would seem they couldn't resist the temptation of let's get rich off of fraudulent money while also getting <laughs> Trump. It's going to be so much hotter. I mean, if you, we get Trump too. Yeah. yeah. Our, our time at the Napa double tree or whatever it is, is going to be so much hotter if we're, if we're, if our stay is paid for by getting Trump bucks. Is this all some weird sex thing? Probably. Oh my God. Is it a weird sex thing for all leftists? It's like, uh, I, 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 as much as I'm joking, I'm sure there probably is a piece of this where they feel like there's like some power element to it. Like we're this power couple who's going to get Trump and the fact that we're, you know, getting rich off of it 
makes it hotter to them. I guarantee that's a factor. For sure. Yeah. So yeah. I, I hadn't um, I haven't been able to listen to the entirety of the hearing from Friday, but as far as the Trump side of it, they're they're not just saying it's one conflict of interest to get Fannie Willis disqualified. They're they actually outlined six conflicts of interest. Um, and so you had, you had some summaries of these. Yeah. Um, so the the first two are pretty obvious. Um, oh, I just closed the outline. Shit. Will you go through the first one? Uh, yeah. So there, there were six, uh, this, this particular Trump lawyer, uh, lawyer, Harry McDougal, who's an attorney for defendant Jeffrey Clark, who's one of the co-defendants. Six financial benefit is, is obvious. I don't need to explain that. The political ambition aspect is also, uh, is also obvious. Um, the deceit, the relationship and associated money. So, um, McDougal pointed specifically to Willis's failure to disclose the gifts from Wade on her annual annual income and financial disclosure report for 2022. I mean, that's not the only thing. But um, I think that that's probably going to be the focus. So and that that, of course, requires gifts and favors above one hundred dollars um, from a prohibited source. So, yeah. And then her recent church speech um, and then the race accusations there, the filings in Wade's divorce case, um, because he engaged in concealing facts, um, which McDougal said. Uh, in his divorce case where he claimed he never entertained a member of the opposite sex during his marriage. So he yeah. clearly lied like that. That also is just the tip of the iceberg. It was like a multitude of lies in his divorce case. Um, and he also said, and the lawyers for the DA, the DA's office, they just sat there and they let him do it. They did nothing to correct obvious perjury, a uh, perjury testimony. So um, yeah. And you only really need one of these. And yeah. the appearance of one of them. Yeah, there's still some question about that. Um, I'll, I'll get to that in a sec, because even though it, I mean, to the layman, reasonable observer, it seems like Fannie Willis has to be cooked on this. But there are some technicals that m- may save her. Uh, at the start of the hearing on Friday, again, this is the, the closing arguments hearing, the judge said he'd rule on disqualification within two weeks. So we'll have an answer soon. And he he signaled he may be prepared to make a ruling without even considering that new text message evidence. Um, and he Which said he's totally damning. <laughs> yeah, he, he said he doesn't necessarily need to see more evidence. But of course, he's going to let both sides have their say before issuing a ruling, which was done on Friday. But here's what he had to say. Now, I think both sides have made requests to reopen the evidence on behalf of the defense. There were some issues with uh, cell phone records, and the state has uh, found an additional uh, witness that they would like to present for today. I think we've reached the point where I'd like to hear more of how some of the legal arguments apply to what has already been presented. And it may already be possible for me to make a decision uh, without those needing to be material uh, to that decision. Again, in the interest of efficiency, if both parties want to reserve part of their time to argue as if those proffered uh, exhibits have been admitted. Feel free to make whatever arguments you, you would like. And if, in fact, it turns out that I do need those to be part of the record to make a decision, then we'd have to come back and we will do those in accordance with the rules of evidence. I've seen two interpretations of that. One is a good sign, and that's the interpretation I take, which is uh, the judge has seen pretty compelling evidence and doesn't necessarily need to see more. Mm hmm. But of course, he has to go through the process of letting both sides make their arguments. He's not going to issue a ruling before. That's how I, that's what I interpret him saying there. More pessimistically, I guess, at least I've seen some commentary to this effect. You might think he's saying he doesn't care about certain evidence or he's done hearing evidence because he doesn't Who would think make been, that interpretation based on what he just said. Who is saying that? Uh, various tweets I've seen. That's all. So, I, yeah, I don't I don't take that to be a discouraging sign. And frankly, I was puzzled that some people did. But uh but yeah, just in in fairness to the interpretation there. Uh, one thing I noticed in this um, NBC reporting that I wasn't knowledgeable of previously. It says that if disqualification happens, uh, the entire Fulton County DA's office is disqualified, not just Fannie Willis. Mm-hmm. So the case would have to be turned over to some other office in Georgia entirely. Yeah. Somebody totally fresh, somebody with no so understanding funny. of the case whatsoever. I mean, that means major delay, which we already kind of expected. But it's also a possibility that a newly assigned prosecutor who has no experience with the case whatsoever, not even in the same office, is just like, F this. Uh, No, I'm not not doing this. Mm. Drops the charges. Could happen. A few lingering questions. I mentioned the legal standard. 
um, and the, the legal standard, I mean, on, on the, uh, on the conflict of interest is this is the standard an actual conflict of interest or is it the appearance of a conflict of interest throughout the hearing the judge had some commentary that was getting after that question apparently there's some debate within the law and court precedent in georgia if it's just the appearance of a conflict with which the judge referenced at the start of these hearings fanny's dead i, I don't know how yeah of you course, say there's not yeah. the appearance of even if it's actual conflict Maybe the judge could find some doubt, but I think there are plenty of ways to find actual there is conflict. There's no way. Of course there they, is. They lied repeatedly. They personally benefited financially. End of list. Uh, but there's even more on that list as, as you went through. Also, here's a fact. I didn't know this. Um, the judge apparently donated 150 bucks to Fannie Willis's campaign in 2020. What? I was surprised to learn that. Does that matter? Based on what I've seen in this particular, this series of hearings, I, I feel like he's been pretty fair. Uh, if he was wildly biased in favor of Fannie Willis, I assume he probably would never have had the disqualification hearings in the first place or not gone as far with them as he has. What you would, you wouldn't have to recuse yourself for them. Apparently not, but that is, Why? Uh, don't you think he, that you should have to, I don't know. I guess I, I don't know all the rule. How, like how, how all that breaks what sort of political donations are. I, I mean, I assume there's nothing against it. I, he's not hiding it. I don't have any evidence or I don't have any reason to say that he's, that he was improper in not disclosing that or something. Mm. Uh, but yeah, apparently he's a Fannie Willis campaign donor, but um, another, another thing, another lingering legal possibility. Remember when this motion was first brought, uh, it's not just a motion to disqualify Nathan Wade and Fannie Willis. It's a motion to dismiss the entire case. We have 18 mm -hmm. co-defendants, all this is massive, complicated case. It seems like a long shot that that's going to happen. The whole case is going to get dismissed, but that's still on the table. That has not been eliminated. And so we, we could see not just a kill shot for Fannie Willis and Nathan Wade, but the entire case could go down, even if that latter part's Probably not likely, but it's still possible. Bottom line on all these uh, Trump cases, as of now, looks like all the Trump prosecutions are falling apart. Yeah. You've got the Jack Smith January 6th case, delayed for months, as we just discussed. Not going to start before the election, almost certainly. Fannie Willis Georgia case, right on the cusp of massive delay at best. Possible drop outright. At the end of the month, we're going to get the Alvin Bragg in New York case, that, that stretch Stormy Daniel case. A misdemeanor business records charge becomes a felony by way of a federal campaign finance violation that was never actually prosecuted by the feds. That one's just the legally weakest of them all. Then again, you know, a New York jury, granted civil trial, not a criminal one, but a New York jury just decided that uh, what's her face? E. Jean Carroll was was sane and believable. So who knows? Maybe New York is a bigger threat. Despite clearly being insane. And then you have uh, the Mar-a-Lago classified documents case in Florida where the yeah. judge has been taking your time. And that one doesn't look like it's headed to trial before the election either. It looks like the best thing they have is Letitia in New York to take all of Trump's money. And I don't know if you saw, but she's threatening to seize his assets if he doesn't pay by like within 30 days. So I'm very reassured if that's really all they're working with. Letitia James. Did you see her latest move? She's suing um, a, a meat packing company for not being honest about their carbon footprint. Oh. So wow. we're going to litigate ourselves into starvation. That's <laughs> what we're going to do. Anyway, uh, uh, we're, that would be a twist. I thought it was going to be our overlords um, cutting off food supply lines, but <laughs> this is fine. That's they're okay. just going to sue anyone who produces food. Okay. That's right. what we'll do. Uh, definitely overdue for a break. So let's catch up with some chatters. Over on Rumble, Yakko 1977 says, if Trump keeps winning primaries and beats any legal traps, who should be his vice president? If you can justify Nikki Haley, I look forward to the mental gymnastics for picking her over literally anyone else. I'm not going to make a case for Nikki Haley. My God. Um, I don't, my, my preference for a political office of any kind is pretty much Rand Paul. Same with the, um, the vacant, while well, the soon to be vacant Senate Republican leadership position because cocaine Mitch is leaving. Uh, Rand Paul. Give me Rand Paul. Yeah, I don't think he'll pick him. Rand Paul. Uh, I, I, my, my guess on who Trump will pick is still the betting favorite, Christy Nome. 
And and if not Christy Nome, it'll be a racial. I, I think there's going to be like the minority checkbox. It's got to be. It's not going to be a white guy like Mike Pence. It's going to be a woman and or black and or and or whatever. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Howdy Twerkman says, I love Nikki Haley. Native so American. Yeah. <laughs> a fake Indian would be a great choice. <laughs> More uh, another fake Indian episode later in the show. Mm. I love Nikki Haley so much. I'm writing a song. This is what I've got so far. Oh, Nikki, you're so pretty. Can't you understand? I'm not going to sing this, but you know what song that is. Okay. <laughs> oh, Nikki, you're so pretty. Can't you understand? You take me by the heart when you badmouth orange man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. That's uh Pretty good. It, it needs a little bit of work. Right now, I'm going to give it the uh, I'm going to give it the sad trombone. But I like the premise. That's, that's, a, that's a badge of honor, though, because I like corny dad jokes like that. <laughs> okay, um, we're good on Odyssey. Good on D Lives. If you want to grab a few off YouTube and Tippy. Zors, funny how joggers have been a part of this country since its founding, yet they still have their own distinct culture and adamantly refuse to integrate. The implications behind that poke holes in the belief system in the belief in sustainable multiculturalism. Yes. I mean, uh, people will not integrate unless they're made to, and then even still will not integrate. Yeah. I mean, well, it's, it's the great debate. It's like the connection. It's the connection between, I suppose, race, race, ethnicity, uh, and values. You know, I mean, I, I want everybody to succeed. Uh, I don't want any culture, any race, anybody to perform poorly, do badly, suffer, any of that. There's no denying, though, that there's a strong correlation between racial or ethnic group and political values. That's why we talk about things like the black vote or the this vote, that group, this group. It's because the, the the group trends are are very strong. And in the case of the black vote, it's like still something in the neighborhood of 90 percent Democrat votes. Yeah. Um, so, and they need to be appealed to differently. Well, to the extent that there is a quote unquote black vote that has a different set of values. I mean, that's what's implied in the premise of the black vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, all this stuff, like people, people act like that's a, a hate, a hate description or something, or like it's, it's, it's somehow putting people down. No, I, I wish everyone would adopt values that lead to prosperity. And I think the Democrat party is the antithesis of that. And I would yeah. love for every black voter out there to reject them because that's the greatest thing they could do politically for their own benefit. But there's also no denying the reality that like the convincing is if it's working, it's very, very slow. It, it I mean, this is, this is snail's pace to the point that Zors is making. And so, yeah, I mean, I, like, I, there's a lot of serious consideration to that question when it's like, well, I, I don't care about race. I only care about values. Right. I do, too. I mean, I care about I care that people have the right values over racial grouping. But at the same time, you can't deny the strong relationship between those things. Right. It just it manifests like itself in many ways. Um, People are I can't believe that anybody's not being intellectually honest at this late stage in the culture about this. And, and don't you want to be honest now so that you can live in reality and you can understand people better? Like, why would you even deny it? Yeah. I mean, and, and I don't think that that means you don't try, you don't stop trying to convince or you give up and all this It's just, but I think there's, you gotta, you gotta be honest about what the prospect of success here is too. And oh, totally. yeah. it's, it's tough. It's, it's not, it's not a great record right now, but who knows, man? Maybe this maybe this will be the one. They keep talking about, you know, uh, a lot of different demographic groups abandoning Biden. Maybe you see a meaningful shift this time. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, if if Biden is not bad enough for you to try something else, I got to see you're bad enough because it's going to get really, <laughs> really bad. But it doesn't matter. That's the point. It doesn't matter how bad their candidate is because they're ideologically driven. He's just like the guy that's going to do their bidding. They don't give a shit who he is. Yeah. He's he's a puppet, but uh, Bill Biz, Laura Towler's husband, Sam, sentenced to two years in prison, one year minimum. He'll miss Laura, birth of a second baby and his toddler during that time. Essentially a thought crime prosecution with appalling UK justice injustice. 
truer words have never been spoken. This is just shocking. I'm surprised shocking. I've heard so little about it in the U.S. I know it's not our country's news, but it's such an egregious case that I figured I would have heard more about it. I, I didn't encounter any of it until the audience mentioned it until you sent it to me. Just It's just incredible to me. Hmm. I suppose not. I mean, with the rape gang situation and then they're, they're letting off rapists and things like that, you would have to think that the um, injustice would also extend to persecuting white people that for basically no reason. <laughs> yeah. Um, Holden Mulray. Hi, truth seekers. Uh, the IRS tracks transactions greater than 600, but theft under 950 isn't prosecuted in California. Are San Francisco tweakers investigated for tax evasion? Or is there a special exemption? Their special exemption is that nobody's going to do anything about this ever. So, yeah. uh, that's a good question, though. Uh, like, do do the San Francisco tweakers and the organized retail thieves, do they report their like black market Walgreens income. <laughs> if, if the IRS, if the IRS starts auditing the black market Walgreens, the open air black market Walgreens, then I'll say, all right, uh, that fair use of my tax dollars. This one time credit word due. It is getting reflected somewhere. The theft though, because they have to report the amount that has been stolen in their taxes. Oh, they're sure. reporting. The, yeah, the company's reporting the losses yeah, yeah. for sure. But then. So, so the losses are being accounted. So, you know, we know what the losses are. Yeah. Well, and then that, that of course, is a, it was a reduction in their own tax liability. So they're they're sending more into this or less into the system as a result of that. Sure. Uh, but yeah. Anyway. Um, Holden Mulray again. Uh, props to you both for building healthy families. The family is the living cell of a culture. That's why evil opposes it vehemently and tries to redefine it. God bless you and your families. Thank you so much. Thank you, Holden. Appreciate How's it. How's your newborn? You. I haven't asked him. You're very long. special. Uh, he's very good. You know, actually, yesterday I got him to laugh for what my wife says the first time. Now, she spends Aww. more time with him, obviously. She's her, his daily caretaker. But last night she was handling something and I was sitting on the couch and I was you know, he's, he's old enough. He's got some neck strength now. So I can kind of do like, I like to take newborns and do like little dance moves with them and stuff. Uh, and so I was doing dance moves with him and he's, he started, you know, laughing out loud he's, and he hasn't done that yet. So that was a cool moment. But, uh, but yeah, what, what special moments have you had? It's been, uh, Annalise is not, she's not a month yet. Is she? She's month. Yeah. Okay. She's five weeks. Yeah. Oh, it's already been that long. I was thinking, man, time flies, I guess, but, um, she's just been, smiles just all smile she started smiling in her first week and so i i took the most beautiful picture of her and emmeline just like both smiling at each other i couldn't believe it mm. i was just like watching them bond yeah um that is so cool it's just so that was cool that that was probably like the first shared smile between them if not the first one yeah of the first. And, and i got a picture of it and it That's was a really cool photo incredible yeah. just watching them interact it was like they knew well emmeline obviously knows because she's not retarded but it was like the baby knew that that was her sister and everything yeah. like that. Um, I just copied and pasted Emmeline. Like I keep showing my husband pictures of Emmeline when she's a baby. And I'm like, look at this cute picture of Annie that I just took. And he's like, oh, yeah, real cute. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> like, Do you feel like the sisters look like each other or they look different? They look so much like each other hmm. that I could be fooled. Oh, so it, it's not just it's not an unattentive husband thing. They actually look very, very close. No, like I, okay. I've been I've been holding up pictures of Emmeline with Annalise's face and like outside of Annalise being so much bigger than Emmeline was. Um, Emmeline was 6'11 and Annalise was 8'15. Yeah. Uh, wow. Outside of that, it's like I like I, I can't even differentiate their facial features and stuff. Hmm. It's, it's really crazy. Nobody wants to hear about this. I'll keep going. Um, <laughs> I bought. Thank PN. you for no, the no, update. Thank, you, thank so. you, Holden, by the way. And thank you, I bought as well. Appreciate it. Aaron, Moyo. I am not going to be niggardly you about Aaron Moyo. Um, Matt and I once made sausage about making and selling bread. Now I'm exempt from the $20 minimum. You are gay. I, I don't know if you know that <laughs> reference, but um, this uh, on Saturday, I posted a video about what appears to be Gavin Newsom corruption in the forthcoming California minimum wage hike, the fast food minimum wage hike yeah. on April 1st. All the fast food places in California have to pay their workers 20 bucks an hour, which is just going to be hilarious. <laughs> but there's a weird robot. carve out where places that bake bread on site and only bread like bakeries. Bakery is defined as a place that makes bread. You can't be a bakery that only makes like cupcakes and pies, bread and bagel. Bagels and croissants don't count either. Bread. And 
uh, Bloomberg News reported with some sources unnamed, granted, but some sources to back it up. This was all done on behalf of Gavin Newsom's high school buddy, who was a major campaign donor to the tune of two hundred and twenty plus thousand dollars, who happens to um, own two dozen Panera bread stores in California. And so, oh, Panera gets this carve out. And now Gavin Newsom's Good denying Lord. it. It's like, no, Panera's not exempt. No, Panera does have to pay them 20 bucks. An hour. That's weird because this whole time you've been saying they don't until it, it was discovered that this looks like a, a deal with your friend. And now you're saying actually he has to pay up. No, that's his defense. It, it, Good Lord. It, yeah, well, it's going to be uh, as with everything in that state, it's going to be a total disaster. We've already Pizza Hut laid off something like 1200 delivery drivers at the end of the year in anticipation of this law coming up. What could possibly go wrong in our economy? From this? Yeah, well, they, they're just like, well, they'll all go to DoorDash or whatever, because DoorDash doesn't have to pay that because they're not considered a fast food business. Right. So they'll just yeah. hand the business, just move them over and reclassify them. The way that businesses manage this is going to be really interesting to watch. And, and you, maybe you jack up prices. Maybe you have robots running your entire operation. Maybe you shrink flate the product. But you're going to have hilariously priced Happy Meals in California. Pro- there in there has to be some way to cover the cost, obviously. Evil like, corporations. I, I can't wait. I can't wait until fast food is a hilarious price in California and evil, greedy corporations are blamed. It's going to be hilarious. We're helping the poor, though. We're, people we're, are so short-sighted that they will still find a way to yeah. blame corporations for this. A slasher. Nice that they force people to get protection for what they now acknowledge is the flu. Oh, well, it was yeah. for the greater good. Yeah, I feel like people aren't properly pissed off about this. That was the CDC now saying like, eh, COVID is basically the flu. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> nice of you to come around. But I'm sure, yeah, really. oh, back then it wasn't. But now that we have the like, whatever variant, now it's really weak and it, it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, okay. Fucking people. Tortuga, I have a very important message. Fuck tax season. I know. I can't think about it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't talk about it. Godspeed. I don't know. Well, um, Tortuga's in Japan, though, right? So we're I don't just going to get. I don't know how they handle it. What's the Japanese IRS like? I don't know. Uh, you have to pay them whatever they ask, or they just like slice you up with a samurai sword. Hmm. That, that's, that's more honorable. This, yeah, I, I'm going to get eviscerated this year because we sold a property. Oh, so like, I, I can't even think about I, I can't think about it. Godspeed. And yeah. So see this. I think, I, I I think your- I'll be. A, well, uh, oh, wait, no, your your daughter was. I was going to say I'll benefit because my son was born just in time. You son of a bitch. I know. For 2023. I thought I was going to make it, yeah. but we did not. We yeah. did not. So I got that working for me. I love your ball tingling soap, but it doesn't last. As mm. your self-appointed business partner, how about this Hero Soap presents Matt Christensen menthol lace banana boat and boxer briefs? You want the briefs loaded, preloaded with menthol? I don't know. I mean, I, I like a, a, a cooling effect in the shower, but I don't know about all day just walking around. It doesn't okay. last, though. You mean the cooling effect or the scent or what? Or do you mean it just know. like the soap the, the itself? The cooling effect is what he's saying. Okay. Um... Yeah, I don't know. Uh, to me, to I would say in my experience, it's definitely stronger when it's fresh. But I would say that that's probably. I mean, to me, it's the same with any soap product that I buy. Like the scent, the quality of it is going to wear out. So I, I, I haven't found it to be more not hero soap though. Sorry, I meant I meant to say that's a lie. It never wears <laughs> out, and it's as fresh day thirty in the shower as it was the day you opened the bag. Yep. No, I, I mean. I, I would grant the point that like the the uh, the effect is going to wear as it is in the shower longer and it's not uh it's not fr- right out of the bag. I just I I would say that I haven't noticed it to be like weaker than other soaps. In fact, I think it's a higher quality product, which is why I use it and endorse it. But thank you dumped by Hero so Bocephus, thank you for for buying the product us. whether you have enjoyed it or not. I appreciate uh your support for the show. I am formerly a will never hawk a product YouTuber. But I really genuinely like myself. And now you're facing a massive IRS bill. So, you know, financial realities have changed. It is so bad. Yeah. Now <laughs> I'm like, what kind of tea that gives you diarrhea? Do you want me to talk about online? I'll do it. I don't care. Um, we should circle back. All right. Thank you guys for your super chats. We'll come back to them at the end of the stream. Um, I'll have to just circle back with you. But let's talk a little bit of a uh, border update and then we'll get into... 
Oh, we still got a lot. Man, I'm going to have to hustle up because we still got a lot of stuff here. We got Border. We got um, the Blaze Reporter. We got Hunter Biden. Okay. All right. Let me get the Border stuff is quick. But Trump and Biden were on the border Thursday. They're each blaming each other for the immigration situation. Trump says Biden has opened up the border for migrant criminals because he has. <laughs> Biden says Trump stopped the border bill in Congress, which was really just a massive spending bill for more processing and court dates at the border, not stopping border crossings. Um, plus, of course, we got the important part, which is getting money to Ukraine and Israel still to be decided. So Biden's people are out arguing that that they've done all that they can at the border and Congress needs to act. And that's an argument that's going to fail miserably because you yeah. can just you look at the facts of what happened. Uh, Number one, though, I'm glad that Joe Biden has finally found the limitations of presidential power. He abused presidential power on student debt. He abused executive authority with his gun control that he continues to pursue. Uh, he did it with the vaccine mandate, of course. But suddenly on the border, well, that's the limitations of my presidential power. I can't do anything about it. <laughs> Other yeah. problem with that argument, though, is he did all kinds of stuff with his presidential power. Day one, uh, he undid a bunch of Trump border policies and said, I'm not making new law. I'm eliminating bad policy. Biden said while signing the orders, he stopped building border wall. He stopped the remain in Mexico policy that of course kept asylum seekers on the other side of the border while their asylum claims are adjudicated instead of releasing them into the interior. This, this argument from Biden is just not going to work. People see through it. That's why his polling on the issue is, is so bad, but so they're going to have to get deeper into the, um, into the propaganda. And the, the new term has dropped. And you see newcomers. They're not illegal immigrants. They're not even asylum seekers. They're newcomers. That's what we're That's going brilliant with. brilliant rebranding. <laughs> Fact sheet released by the White House advocating for the border bill. The White House noted the bill includes $1.4 billion for cities and states who are providing critical services to newcomers. And that propaganda term aside, which is absurd, it's that's the reason nobody wants this bill. Nobody wants one point four billion dollars of worth of incentives for cities and states to house and facilitate illegal immigrants. We want like a fraction of that for for moats and alligators at the border <laughs> or catapults. Yeah, catapults. No, nobody wants. Well, wouldn't it be great if we have housing for illegals in Chicago? No, no that would not be great. I don't want states incentivized for more of that. So they're still trying to sell it on this. It's hilarious. Uh, and not that that um, Corinne Jean-Pierre is particularly talented at uh, propagandizing in any context. This is a, a particularly difficult context in which to propagandize for the president, though. And she's really struggling to handle the messaging. <laughs> I don't know what, frankly, if I were her and I was asked, uh, like, defend the Lake and Riley murder from a Joe, uh, a pro Joe Biden perspective, what would you say? You're like I'm out. I can't do it. In yeah. defense of Corinne Jean Pierre, I don't think I would do much better than this. So first of all, <sighs> I want to offer uh, our condolences to the family uh, of Lake. And I mean, this is a horrific, horrific loss for any family. And obviously, uh, any if whoever is found guilty, uh, we need to make sure that uh, make sure that that happens. And obviously, uh, we don't want to uh, we don't want to see uh, anything happen like that again. But here's the thing: we have done the work. Uh, to make sure we're but. dealing with a broken immigration system. The Republicans have gotten in the way. Okay. I, I don't want to hear you talking about how somebody was murdered by an illegal immigrant and how it's so horrible, but, <laughs> but <laughs> nothing. But you pixie little monster. Whoever is responsible. <laughs> As though it's yeah. just like, we don't Whatever know. Whatever newcomer may or may not be responsible for this horrific murder. You hear how she says that? He's, did she say horrific? Yeah, she drops her H's sometimes. Oh. She thinks it makes her sound smart or less black or something. But it doesn't. <laughs> horrific. That sounds like a boating enthusiast convention or something <laughs> like that. It's horrific. <laughs> you know, that's what happens at the, at the Rio Grande when they're trying to cross. It's, it's <laughs> horrific. Their oaring or lack of is horrific. I never noticed that about her. Uh, yeah, but... Whoever, whoever is responsible. The guy's arrested. We know who he is. We know who he is. Yeah. We know where he came from. We know he came in under the Biden administration uh, yeah. through Venezuela. We have all this information. What is she talking about? I don't even understand the point she was trying to make about Republicans. Oh, I, on that, I don't know. Yeah. It's like he came in under this president released in, in sanctuary city jurisdictions that specifically protect people like this. 
Uh, what Republican had anything to do with this? And I say that yeah. I'm not like trying to be protectionist for Republicans. I, I just don't understand. What, like everything about that guy's presence in this country was the doing of a Democrat. Mm -hmm. Every single one. So, I don't, oh, if only we had the bill in place where we would have one point four billion dollars for newcomers and billions more for Ukraine and Israel, then she wouldn't have been murdered. Now, she wouldn't have been murdered if he was stopped at the border like he should have been or if upon arrest in New York, he was detained and hand over, handed over to ICE or there was he apparently had another legal encounter in Georgia, too. He had multiple oh, really? encounters with law enforcement. Hmm. Uh, but on Lake and Riley, her funeral was Friday. It's, of course, the, uh, the the nursing student at the University of Georgia who unfortunately succumbed to the dangers of solo female jogging. That's all that happened here. By a newcomer from a, Athens. A newcomer intervened in her solo female jog. A newcomer of Athens. You're right. I forgot. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, why am I? It's horrible. The whole thing's horrible. Why am I laughing? Uh, the, the, her mom, Lake and Riley, uh, Lake and Riley's mom, Allison Phillips, released a statement, her first public statement since the murder, calling it a, quote, uh, an unavoidable tragedy in a Facebook post. And she says, or, sorry, she un said no. unavoidable. Let me back up. She called it. Thank you for clarifying an avoidable tragedy. Oh, avoidable I was like, tragedy. not we're not going to tibbits this. Chick. No, 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 no. OK, good. No, right. she released a statement um, calling it an avoidable tragedy. And she said, I'd like to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for being with nah. me and my okay. family during this heartbreaking time. I encourage everyone to have a personal relationship with Jesus. I oh. give him all the glory for getting us through this. So Godspeed to that family. And there, there is a GoFundMe still on uh, for, for Lake and Riley's memorial. They were looking for $35,000 to cover the costs of her funeral and whatever other associated costs. It's sitting at just south of um, a quarter million dollars right now. And at this oh, funeral... Wow. There were a thousand people outside in bad weather paying tribute. There have been other political rallies on her behalf and to get some some positive action at the border as well. So people are fired up about this as they should be. And uh, and if Joe Biden Awful. wants to say that everybody else is responsible for the border policy that allows this to happen, it's really weird that he keeps suing the state that's trying to stop this from happening Recall the state of Texas has tried all sorts of methods for stopping illegal immigrate uh, illegal immigration across the Rio Grande, including buoys and fencing that the federal government keeps opposing and trying to force them to remove and suing them for. Well, Texas, of course, passed their own law allowing state law enforcement to arrest illegal border crossers. And despite Texas doing this with its own police power on its own budget in a way that would certainly address the problem. No, that's not good enough either. The federal government wants that halted. The Justice Department joined with the ACLU, which I, I understood to mean the American Civil Liberties Union. Now it's the newcomer Civil Liberties Union, apparently. Uh, they sued, DOJ and ACLU sued Texas to stop these Ill illegal immigrant arrests, which uh, are set to take, the law is set to take effect next week, but now it won't because... Uh, a federal judge issued a preliminary injunction to stop it because the DOJ and ACLU sued. The judge uh, issuing this this um, injunction to stop the enforcement cited the supremacy clause of the Constitution and the Supreme Court and Supreme Court precedent to say that states don't have their own immigration enforcement power except as authorized by the federal government, and this is unauthorized. And actually, in a pure from as a pure legal matter. I agree the federal government is responsible for border enforcement. The question is, what happens when they just say no? Yeah. <laughs> what happens when they're like, nah, yeah. I don't feel yeah. like it. That's what we're watching. And so nor what? Yes, I want the, fe the federal government to have jurisdiction over this issue. And yes, I, I, I understand the legal principle that Texas has to allow the federal government to manage this issue, which is in their jurisdiction. But when the federal government refuses to do its job, someone's got to. I hope it's not a matter of principle. It's just a matter of reality here. I hope Texas says cool injunction. Don't care. We're going to make some yeah. arrests and we'll see if Joe Biden's feds actually have the balls to go in and start freeing illegal immigrants out of Texas prisons. <sighs> Oh man! And you want to do that Can in election year? S send the yeah, send your feds to go jailbreak newcomers from Texas prison. And and yeah, of course I would prefer 
a country where the courts and the law are respected. And on pure principle, I think that that the federal government has the jurisdiction here. The, the state government. Yeah, does but not. this we ain't it. And somebody yeah. has to walk it back at some point. We, we don't have the country that I want. Biden yeah. doesn't respect the courts or the law. He does whatever he wants repeatedly. Texas should, too. I look forward to watching that play out. And I think uh, Abbott might do that. I don't know. We'll see. Mm-hmm. how We'll see how they do this. But call his bluff. Start arresting illegals. Put them in state prison. See what happens. See if the, see if they send. Uh, they actually get they they militarize ICE or whoever, and they they go release them. You, you want to you want those optics? Go for it. Anyway. I don't think they'll care. Uh, who's wh- you mean the Fed? The Biden administration. I, I think that they they don't give a shit about having bad optics. You think they would actually do it? Like they would uh, go bust up Texas? I think they would. Yeah, hmm. they're they're cooking the books for the next election. They've, they've got this in the bag. They don't seem threatened at all. And it seems like they want Trump to get elected so that there's some sort of violent outburst and they can January 6th all of us. This is all part of the plan. It's hey, all part of the plan. Yeah. Speaking of they January 6th, another guy, a reporter. And uh, they, they, they weren't as this story has developed. There's been a lack of clarity on the charges. So I've been holding on to the possibility that maybe he did some shit. No, he didn't do anything. This is all the government today. has that we've seen in this affidavit. Uh, ooh. I mean, that's pretty weak, even by January 6th standards. OK, Steve Baker is just a libertarian nerd that works for the blaze who's in a Bowie cover band. OK, this guy's not a threat to democracy or whatever. So he's an investigative reporter at the blaze and the FBI issued an arrest warrant uh, uh, asking him to self-surrender on Friday. Um. He was working as an independent journalist on January 6th, and he claims that he did not commit any property property damage. And as far as I can tell from the affidavit, he did not. Um, And he just entered the U.S. Capitol building after the Senate and the House were evacuated. So, like, he went in, he went into Nancy Pelosi's office and, like, there were some people there and he was like, huh, how about that? But most of this case seems to be built on there's this trespassing angle, but it's also like, let's review his texts and see how he felt. Yeah. about the January 6th situation. Um, and that's exactly what they did. So uh, in his text, he said that he was in the first breach, that he was in Nancy Pelosi's office. Um, officers attempted to keep, this is this uh, came came later. Officers attempted to keep Baker from the other side of the door jam, but instead of heeding their instructions, he antagonized them. Baker re- repeatedly asked, are you going to use a gun on us? This is what they're calling an- being antagonized <laughs> um, in the affidavit. He said, please don't shoot us. Yeah. yeah, all he said was, "Are you gonna, are you gonna shoot us?" And they're claiming in the affidavit that that is an example of him antagonizing and brutalizing officers. <laughs> Brutal? Did they say brutalizing? They said antagonized for sure. I don't okay, know okay, okay, okay. Brutalizing um, would be hilarious. Verbally brutalizing, perhaps. So yeah, basically all he revealed in his text messages was that he he was in the first breach, um, and that he was in Nancy Pelosi's office. He did not admit to any property crime. He kind of just like watched people mildly fuck some stuff up and he was like cool <laughs> here's the video the video of his arrest on friday a real terrorist walking among us <laughs> glad they got him i was looking he said in a statement they didn't have to go this route uh, we've been told that my charges are only misdemeanors and my attorney has assured that this will be an in not affair with no intention to detain me, but rather than issuing a simple order to appear, they, uh, went the arrest warrant route. So they were doing this for the optics. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just outrageous. It's like, this is what, this is what they're going to get people on this misdemeanors a summary of the affidavit in nbc who you know along with the guardian with the prior uk case we're talking about these are people who are inclined to maximize the case here Um, what did what did baker do he referred to nancy pelosi as a bitch after talking about the mob raiding the former house speaker's office a comment which he allegedly regretted okay uh he he, look why would he regret that nancy pelosi is she's an old bitch actually what he said is He regretted that he didn't steal government's property during the attack. So regretting, I regret that I didn't commit crime is evidence of a crime, I guess. So um, 
Uh, look out your windows, bitches. Look what's coming. Baker allegedly said as he recorded himself approaching the Capitol on January 6th. Okay. They got, okay. They got Pelosi's office and, you know, it couldn't happen to a better deserving bitch. He said in the video. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. More commentary. Oh, he also said, the only thing I regret is I didn't steal their computers because God knows what I could have found on those computers. If I had done that, he said, according to the, that's, uh, not, that's not even a threat. <laughs> uh, the, this is, this is the, the silver bullet here. Do I approve of what happened today? Baker said in another interview on January 6th, according to the FBI filing, I approve 100%. What a menace if to you, society. This guy is. If you approve of crime <laughs> after the fact. Okay. Let's, we're entering weird legal territory here, but I'm glad another elderly terrorist is off the streets. We got him. You won't have to worry about this man ruining your democracy anytime soon. All right. Uh, also on uh, Capitol Hill this week, Hunter Biden finally uh, testified. He uh, he was before the House Oversight and Judiciary Committees. Of course, um, they are pursuing the Biden impeachment inquiry and this uh, deposition was behind closed doors. The The transcript is out though. And, um, and what we got was mostly the canned denial from, from Hunter that Joe was never involved in Hunter's business dealings in any capacity, despite plenty of evidence that he was, uh, we, we, we've gone through that many times on the show. Joe met with Hunter's business partners. Joe took calls with Hunter's business partners Talking about the weather, though, that's all they were doing. Devin Archer was testifying that Joe Biden was the brand that Hunter was selling. As we'll get to in a moment, 10% for the big guy on the laptop. Uh, Hunter texting his Chinese business partner that he has to pay up because otherwise uh, Joe is going to get him. And then we also have the supposedly the now allegedly false claim of FBI informant Alexander Smirnov that Burisma executives paid Joe and Hunter directly to clean up their political problems in Ukraine. They've put that guy in prison. They arrested him again and put him in prison. They arrested him twice for the same crime and found and found the district court judge in LA who put him in prison pending trial, which we don't even do with, you know, Bernie Madoff and the rest of like the, the greatest defenders of all time. This guy who allegedly lied about Burisma corruption is is such a threat that he has to rot in prison before trial happens. But we got some information from Hunter on at least two of those points. 10% for the big guy. Uh, I've seen some characteriz characterizations, including in the New York Post here. Hunter Biden finally acknowledged Joe was the big guy. I, I'm i reading the commentary here, and I could see how you might infer that. I don't... Not that I find this exonerating, but Hunter was asked who the big guy is. Of course, the big guy is referenced in, in emails um, from Hunter's laptop that are the discussions of a Chinese business deal and this uh, this James Gilliar, who's one of Hunter's business partners, they're breaking down how the uh, money from the business deal is going to be dispersed. And it says 10 held held by H for the big guy, that infamous email. Uh, so Jim Jordan asks Hunter Biden, uh, the reference to the big guy, you would agree is a reference to your father. And Hunter responds, I truly don't know what the hell James referring to that business partner, what he was talking about. All I know is what actually happened. The agreement did the agreement didn't have anything to do with my father. My father's never been involved in my business. Now, that was an outright denial. What are what is everyone talking about? I'm, I'm that's why that's what I'm missing with the headline here. Now, one way to read that is yes, the big guy means Joe, but uh, this James business partner guy was just talking nonsense. Another way to read that is I don't even know who James is talking about when he says the big guy. What's missing here is the explicit statement. Yes. Joe Biden is the big guy who was described in, in those emails. So I think this, this claim that he admitted that, that Joe, that Joe is the big guy is a little bit overstated unless I'm missing something. No. Um, I see inference and maybe it's a reasonable inference, but I see Hunter saying that he doesn't know that said, um, the, I don't think that that's exonerating. Um, we still have the email itself and the idea that, that, Hunter doesn't know what his business partners are talking about when they have a specific breakdown of, about who's going to get paid what yeah. with a clear reference to him paying someone. He has no idea who that is. You're holding 10% for whom? I have no idea. I don't even know what he's talking about. I mean, that's preposterous. So this is not to say like it's not – everybody knows the big guy is Joe. I'm not disputing that point. I, I'm just – I think that the, the claims that Hunter openly admitted 
uh, admitted that are a little bit overstated. That's all. There, um, there was additional commentary on the famous WhatsApp message to uh, to Hunter's Chinese business partner Henry Zhao in 2017, or Raymond Zhao. That's part of his defense. It, he got his Zhao's mixed up. So actually, I don't know which Zhao was supposed to get this one. But Hunter texts this Zhao Chinese businessman uh, on WhatsApp in 2017. Hey, you better pay me because I'm sitting right next to my dad. And he'll he'll make you pay if you don't. And then Zhao promptly yeah. sent Hunter $5 million. And now Hunter says that he was high or drunk when he sent that message. And he's really embarrassed because he sent it to the wrong guy. And his dad wasn't even with him at the time. That's what he said in this deposition. Now, he got some problems there. Uh, number one, Hunter was photographed at his dad's house the day he sent that message. So he was definitely, I guess maybe dad wasn't home, I guess. I don't, I don't know. But he's at his dad's house. He engaged in multiple texts with this Zhao, suggesting that's not a mistake. Plus, the payment promptly then came through. So is it just coincidence that he, like, text harassed the wrong guy and then he got paid $5 million? And besides, if you text the wrong number, it doesn't erase the content of the message. So if I text a random number saying, give me $100 now or I'm going to kill you. I've just threatened somebody and it's not a defense for me to say like, Oh no, I meant to threaten the person. I meant to threaten the other guy. (laughs) My mistake. That doesn't doesn't make any sense. And, and the big problem is not just all of those inconsistencies, but this is what I meant by the Donna Brazil defense at the top of the Mm -hmm. show. Hunter's team originally said last summer, because remember we got this text through the IRS whistleblowers and they said, it's not even real. That's fake. That screenshot is not real. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Hunter's lawyer, Abbey Lowell, I think is how you pronounce his name, but he's the same guy who was with Hunter during this deposition. He said at the time, the, the, the supposed screenshot is fake. It's not real. And it contains a myriad of issues. Were you lying then? Are you not? Are you lying now? They're lying all the time is the correct answer. They're lying in both instances. Uh, but that, but that to me, the admission that it was not in fact fake and that Hunter's new defense is I was high and drunk when I was threatening someone with a shakedown. Mm. That's probably the biggest takeaway from the um, deposition, though. <laughs> the, the, such things are not really new either. I mean, that's kind of par for the Biden course. I guess it hadn't occurred to me that this drug addiction might might serve to benefit him in the future. Yeah. Well, it is a catch all excuse. I don't remember. I was drunk and or high. In fact, I can't even tell you mm-hmm. if I was drunk or high. Presumably both. It was pretty functional, though. Well, I mean, if you're if you're actually running around grabbing bags of money, you have to be like, yeah, at he least was doing alert international business deal. He was clearly able to maintain an erection. I don't think things <laughs> were going that badly for him. Uh, that was the cocaine, I assume. Maybe uh, anyway, time for some hoax hate aye, aye. behind schedule. I'll try to hurry up. Now, the nobody saw it happen, but it's totally a product of Trump's America hoax hate crime of the week. Ah, shit, it's backwards. You think they'll notice? In your old neck of the woods, the St. Louis Public School District, a black bus mechanic named Amin Mitchell, says he has been racially harassed at work for weeks. And when he told his bosses about it, they did nothing. And now he's discovered a noose in his workspace. And now bus drivers in the school district are protesting in solidarity by calling out sick from work on his behalf. Roughly a quarter of bus routes didn't run on Monday. So we'll defeat racism by making sure all those black students can't go to school. Here's the story. The drivers at Missouri Central Bus Company say they called in in solidarity with their coworkers, the mechanics. And the mechanics say this is all because of alleged racial discrimination. These type of gestures and props are just a message for what is to come. I mean, Mitchell is a mechanic at Missouri Central Bus Company who says he's endured racial slurs and harassment day in and day out since starting two months ago. He says he's reported it to his job's HR. And he says after that is when a noose was left in his work bay. Nobody came up to me to apologize about that. I found it, found a noose. Nobody came to acknowledge them for how hurt I am, how much pain or how much, how traumatized I am. On Monday, dozens of bus drivers called in sick, forcing the district to make other arrangements. 
Parents like Michelle Morgan had to pick up her son Monday because of the disruptions to the bus service. It sucks. Wherever you go, it's always going to be right, right somewhere. So you just have to know how to deal with it and just ignore it and just keep it pushing. Now, I mean, says he's giving Missouri Central two weeks to investigate his and his co-workers alleged discrimination. He says if not, that's when he's willing to take it to the NAACP. I love the mom in there. Happen. I get called the N-word all the time. You think I complain? Like, thank you. <laughs> you walk it off. <laughs> uh, yeah. But she's right. Like, even if this was real, which it isn't, at least I'm going to contend it's not. Um, y- yeah, sorry. Like, mean word. Deal with it, okay? Mean words. Deal with it. You'll be okay. I don't you- know. Uh, I support this guy because this is one way to stop um, inner city bus. <laughs> with the county. It's like how many county kids were saved from getting their asses kicked by black kids on this day. <laughs> the world will never know. It's how, many, <laughs> we'll never know. how many licks to the center of a Tootsie Pop. There is some okay. West County white nerd that is having his only day of freedom since he started. <laughs> yeah. By the way, as you saw in the, the report that the guy was in the army and like he's a former, former army mechanic of some sort. Yeah. I don't know what his job in the army was. I presume it's something related to that. You were in the army, though, and you're traumatized by the shape of a knot or a rope. Uh, OK, also, that wasn't a noose. Did you see how there was no slip knot there? Like, how were you going to hang somebody with that? Yeah, I don't have a picture of it handy, so I, I don't know. It was it but it was story. like the Bubba no, Wallace was, one where it was it was wound super tight. It's and like it was small not, and it was small. It's yeah. like you're not going to get your big black head in there and then nobody's going to be able to tighten it around your neck. So what's the point? That's not a noose. That's a that's a rope with a knot in it. By the way, uh, St. Louis, um, he's saying he's he's one of only two black mechanics at this uh, third party bus company. Um, I notice he uses the word mechanics. Too. I'm going to bet that he works with a great many. Uh, he, he works with a very diverse workforce, I would assume. Um, mm. uh, the idea that it's all a bunch of like Klansmen running this bus company in St. Louis. Uh, doubt I'm going to. Yeah. The guy's chasing a lawsuit and he's and that's not even speculation. I don't think I, it, he practically says so outright do what i say or i'm gonna get the naacp okay listen to this quote from some other local reporting this is just one instance of racism mitchell has experienced at work according to him the noose was found a day after he was in an argument with his manager who allegedly said mitchell was not qualified for his job oh well (laughs) how how convenient you're performing poorly at work maybe you'll get fired and the next day you find a noose to shield yourself and threaten legal action. Don't give away the motive yeah, too yeah. easily there, Jesse. It's a creative way to try to get out of the ghetto, probably. I mean, you, you, have you seen Hoop Dreams? They used to have to get really good at basketball. <laughs> and now they're just like, okay, I'll just make up some hate crime. Let's see if that now works. Now it's new streams. <laughs> yeah. To, th- okay, here's another one. Eureka, California. Another That's where sup- I was born. Oh, well, this is like this is the tour of blonde uh, <laughs> hoax. Hey, I, I, I forgot that you were born in Northern California, no. Eureka, California. Another supposedly black guy, though you might not know it if he didn't tell you. But another supposedly black guy says his pickup truck for his tile business was burned. And not only that, the perpetrator spray painted the N word on it. The owner, Archie Claibon's business slogan is, I tile, you smile. But there were no smiles last Tuesday when the unthinkable <laughs> happened in his community. Look at this. Not Claibon one. says he woke There's up the smile. to find his work truck vandalized in the V worst way, having been set on fire with a repulsive racial slur spray painted on it. Hateful Which to one? have that word scrolled across my truck, especially Black History Month. It just, it bugs me that the N word was used, you know, burn my truck down. I could attribute it to, hey, you know, people were just being punks, but you burn it down and put the N word on it. Now I'm like, how personal is this really? Claibon reported the vandalism to Eureka police. They're getting him a report for insurance. That Kaniga is Mexican. <laughs> He's, uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know what it's like in in Eureka, but if I saw that guy on the street, I w- I would guess Hispanic actually. If I if I had to, un- he's maybe quarter black, maybe. I don't think anybody don't know, who's, who hates black people is identifying him first and foremost as the most obvious black guy. He around. looks like fucking Dan Bongino. That guy's not black. <laughs> Dan Bongino is like Italian or something. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. To be fair, Dan Bongino looks black. 
He looks like a black. I actually, Italian. I think he does. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but the, that part, you know, burn my truck down. I understand, but use the N word. Like, what do you mean? Like, what you, are you uh, talking about? You understand the burning of your property, but if someone calls you a mean name, that... I would be so much more pissed if somebody <laughs> burned my Mazda than if somebody called me a cracker. Are you people insane? I didn't mind when they murdered my children and raped my wife. <laughs> it was when they called me a piece of shit that I really. <laughs> That was the real crime. Back priorities. There's some, so this reporting here, local reporting, um, it reads in part, speaking about the psychological impact, he said, you know, that's the other thing. I'm more embarrassed now than anything because I can't remember the last time somebody had the courage to say the N-word to my face. Well, isn't that... Uh, well, isn't they didn't that... say it to your face. <laughs> oh, wait, where's that quote in here? Well, anyway, he said that, he said that somewhere in here. Yeah. I, I can't remember this last time someone said the N word to my face. I mean, isn't that kind of demonstration that it's very rare and this doesn't, this doesn't quite make a lot of sense. Uh, but in this report, in that video report you saw, he, he says, or the reporter says at the end, I'm not doing a GoFundMe because I'm not looking for a handout. So my guess is this is probably the classic insurance fraud case. Oh, uh, yeah. Tile business has been a little bit slow. Got to shore up your finances. That truck looks like it costs probably at least 50 grand who knows if he's behind on the payments or something you fake a racist arson you get out of it but you, you read some of the coverage here and, and it that it sounds like that might be the case uh he said in part about his truck he regarded it as more of a vehicle uh, as more than a vehicle stating quote it's just a billboard right now of course it had his business plastered all over it it's business oh yeah. it, it's just a billboard right now i was trying to capitalize on all the money i spent on that truck oh so you are heavily invested in this truck now they, the, uh, there was some dispute about this truck prior to the arson incident. He was um, parking this truck on the street side near a church that he was doing some tile work on. And all the neighbors were complaining because the car wasn't authorized to park there and he was leaving it overnight or something like that. So the city had actually been speaking with him and saying, you got to move your truck, man. You can't park there. But they didn't give him citations. They didn't, um, mm. they didn't give him punishment. They just politely reminded him to please move his truck. So the claim here is that all these neighbors were like mildly irritated about him parking in a place where he shouldn't be. And they were very polite about it for weeks and weeks and said, please don't leave your, your truck overnight. Even if you consider it a billboard for advertising for your business. And so they went from zero on the racist hate scale to like a hundred overnight yeah. because the truck was parked there. It's actually pretty smart. Cause now he's going to get all this business. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I'm maybe uh, maybe he will. I, I don't know what the market for anti-racist um, bathroom renovations is. I'm sure there are a lot of sad white people that are uh, susceptible to this. You know, I looked at his work, too, and I got to say, like, he's done some bathrooms that look pretty sweet. The tile work looks pretty quality. I A lot of the showers looked awesome. Like, oh. And I so. I mean, I don't I don't mean this to dispute the quality of his work. It looks nice, but maybe he's just maybe he's heavily invested in a lot of um, aspects of his business, his truck included. And he's got costs to cover that aren't getting covered would be my guess in, in how this played out. Mm. Oh, and then uh, there's a before we get to the movie review, another fake Indian. But this lady had. So, well, this lady like didn't know she was not Indian was the claim, but now it looks like she knew she was lying. Yeah, I think she knew she was lying the whole time. Okay, so her name is Elizabeth Hoover, and she apparently was raised to believe that she had a native ancestry in this very uh, small nomadic tribe, the name of which I didn't write down and can't remember because I don't care. <laughs> um, on both her father and her mother's side of the family. And then there apparently were like, hardly any people in this tribe at the time so i'm like your father and mother like, this huh. sounds like the fake girlfriend who goes to a school district <laughs> or goes to a school you've never heard of yeah oh yeah, i yeah, totally yeah. had like an indian in my <laughs> family history you've yeah, never heard totally. of the tribe it's too complicated so i guess what happened she's a professor at berkeley she some other native american professors uh were asking her some questions and one of them happened to be a descendant of this same tribe and they asked her what her maiden name was and they were like bitch we don't know you and because i know everybody that's in this native american tribe there's no possible way that you could have also been a part of this tribe so she felt like the walls were closing in on her so 
she self outed and she wrote a huge article about how um, she's a pretend Indian and it's not really her fault because it was family lore. Now, where have we heard this one before? Isn't that the Elizabeth Warren defense? It is the Elizabeth Warren defense. Um, and she said, like, this was what my mother had told me my entire life and blah, da, 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 da. I'm like, that is really specific. You know, it's not like she was like, I'm one 256 Cherokee or whatever. It was like she built an entire identity and life, like walking around Berkeley with her long, straight, silky hair and yeah. her beaded earrings and shit. You know, um, painting with all the colors of the wind and yeah, you know, the whole thing, yeah. the whole thing, uh, just just made an identity for herself. Um, and then she's like, JK. And then she turned it on everybody. This makes me kind of like her. So she said, I'm not going to be driven out because I still have usefulness. I still did all that work and the research and the learning and the teaching. And I'm not going to have all of that just canceled and thrown away because people are upset about this. I love this. This is so great. We need more of these racial hoaxes because they just rip apart people's people's like really secure identities about like who they are and like what weird cannibal tribe they came from yeah. and stuff like that. And um, I think that, that this is hilarious. Like it's just devalues all of this Berkeley Native American studies horse shit. And, you know, it, it, there is a there's a point there like she knows a lot about Indian ancestry and Indian culture. And she she did spread all that knowledge to all these other people, Yeah, which I, I don't have a problem with as long as you're just not doing it under, under a, a, the premise of a lie or a false pretense. You don't get to lie about who you are, or what your identity is. I don't think that just because yeah. you're white, you have no business discussing the history of Native Americans or something. No, uh, I. She really but, did a better job than Rachel Dole's, although like she really looked the part. It is a lot easier to LARP Indian than the LARP black, though. So maybe I'm comparing apples and oranges here. But like this chick really does look like she's something. I guess I could believe it. A lot of it is like people of, of um, Indian ancestry mostly these days have have some, you know, something else in them. They're not pure Native American. So maybe she just looks Indian because like a lot of Indians have become more white over time. I don't know. Yeah. I bet she's had she, something else. Let's put it this way. Hey if she <laughs> if she went to the res, she might look more identifiable. Let me put it that way. I don't know. I think she blends. Hmm. Like outside of her not being obese or have having had limbs lost from alcoholism, like <laughs> diabetic alcohol. I mean she looks like in really good health, but otherwise I'm like, okay, maybe. All right. Let's talk movie review. You ready? Yeah. In a world of movie references flying Flat. over his head, one man will finally watch them. This is the Matt and Blonde Show movie review. Tonight's movie is the 2007 British action comedy Hot Fuzz, in which an elite London police officer is reassigned to a small town in the countryside, discovering its claim of peace and safety is a lie, and the place is run by a murderous cult in pursuit of the greater good. Uh, we don't have commentary from our movie nominator this week. Uh, movie picker Matt opted not to provide commentary, but we thank him for his nominations. We do have the face swaps, though. And uh, in both of these cases, when I received them, I'm like, that's pretty much just a picture of me. <laughs> like This one's just a picture of me. And I don't own a, 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 a FAL, an FAL. Uh, I don't own that rifle. But other than that, it looks like something I might do. Um, and then there was this one where we're eating ice cream in the car. And I'm like, yeah, that's that's me like 10 years ago when I was a lot heavier. That's pretty much <laughs> that's also just a picture of me. Uh, yeah, but, and me right now because I'm so fat from the baby. You know what I like about uh, your image in this is that the AI render, it got like the braid look, but it didn't bother with the top of your hair. The top of your hair is still like a man's short haircut. So you have this like m braided mullet is basically what it rendered. That's frightening. That's hilarious. Uh, speaking of frightening, of course, we have to take a look at the video mm -hmm. face swap. Now we've put you in the castle, sweet. Bernard will escort you up there. Yeah. Well, uh, actually, I could probably make my own way up. 
hag. I beg your pardon. Evil old woman considered frightful or ugly. It's twelve time. Oh, bless you. <laughs> All right, your review and your rating. Oh, everyone's gonna hate me. Okay, something about this movie, I just, I just did not connect with it. I'm not saying it was bad, nor that it wasn't funny. Like a few of the scenes really got me. Um, maybe I just wasn't in the right mood. I did laugh really hard a few times, but I thought it was inferior to Shaun of the Dead. And I should say that I don't generally like spoof films or really cop films. So this was starting like way behind the finish line. Just wasn't super interesting to me. Um, But it was witty. And my review is probably not fair. I gave it a three out of five. I do wish that it had had more of that quintessential British humor. Like I felt like this was like an American spin on uh, on British humor. And I, I wanted more of that. You're you know? pulling your punches. Stop going to bat for British comedy. If you hate this movie, just hate it. But if you're giving it a three, you clearly didn't hate hate. I didn't hate it. No, yeah. I mean, I, I was watching it and I was like in in a different time when I smoked weed. I think this might have been a real, you know, I, I think I would have had a lot more fun. Do you think that this broke the British comedy mold for me? Or do you think it that I, uh, again, am not a fan? Well, I think of all the British comedies that you're the most likely to like this one. Okay. Because it was the least like quintessential British comedy. My guess is that you gave it a four. And you didn't cheat? You didn't look at the review? Did you? No, I did not. I did give it a four. (laughs) And actually, I thought that I was going at the start because... As I wrote in the review, I saw this when it came out when I worked at a video store in college, but I forgot almost everything about it. And I remember having a generally fond opinion of it, but I forgot almost the entire premise. So it was basically a fresh viewing for me. And um, and it, it's, this movie was kind of two halves where in the start I thought, oh, God, is this like a, am I oh, looking no. at a British dad joke montage here? Is that, is that what I'm watching? Kind of. There's a lot of setup, which is one thing I didn't necessarily like but trying to sell you on the points i like i thought the action but particularly the deaths excellent all the deaths <laughs> like how did i forget the the spire falling on that guy's head holy cow and the thing with yeah. slasher movies or the sort of slasher style where people get murdered in sequence to keep them surprising when everybody knows it's coming is hard and a lot of slasher movies end up being kind of boring because you're only on your at the edge of your seat for like a second and then you know it's coming and it's not scary anymore not that this was scary but the sequence of deaths all of them are like holy shit I mean, the garden shear stab the tripping and falling on the spike into it's just a lot of brutal memorable scenes I mean, the, the greater good cult, the neighborhood watch association that is running this town, that might as well be the CDC or any other government agency. Yeah. Like, sure, we violate your rights and don't care about any basic sense of morality, but it's for the greater good. Sure, we might murder you in cold blood, but it's for the greater good. It was entertaining to watch that. Cause it's like, yeah, if you guys only knew what was going to come, uh, what, like. I don't know, 15 years down the line, less than that. Uh, I thought this point about propaganda through statistical deception was really interesting that this town, they want to maintain their image of low crime. It's safe. So they just reclassify and redefine everything. You know, there aren't murders here. There are just a lot of accidents. We're watching our politicians do that right now, whether it's inflating mass shootings or treating criminals leniently such that you have lower convictions by not pursuing serious crimes or downgrading them to misdemeanors or however you do it. We see a lot of that propaganda through redefinition or reassigning things. We, we see that um, play out in real life all the time now. So it was interesting to see that as sort of a, a joke premise, but it's, it's a little too true to be a complete joke. An interesting point on Danny's struggle Danny is the the fat cop friend on whether he wants to stick with his murderous dad or help out his new buddy friend, Nicholas, the other cop. And he's really struggling with what do I do here? Do I I'm like my, my dad's a murderer, but he's also my dad. Like, how do I square this? I just thought it was really interesting. And, and he makes the correct decision to stick with with uh, his buddy and to stick with justice for murder. But 
his hesitation is interesting because I think that correct decision has to be properly qualified. And that's the reason that he, he hesitates so much. The threshold to abandon family or turn on family in the way that he does, I suppose, that's got to be extremely high. Mm-hmm. It's like the, the saying God country, or God, I already messed it up. God family country, right? The, people say that it's, it's those, um, it's those things in order for a reason. The idea being there's really only one thing that should be above your loyalty to family. And that's your loyalty to God himself or the author of the moral rules of the universe. However you wish to think about that concept. So like, in this comedy sense, yeah, if your dad's a cold blooded murderer, it's, it's probably a good thing to pursue justice in that case, even though it would involve betraying a family member. But if your dad's just like an annoying person with Trump derangement syndrome or something, um, <laughs> give him a break. Yeah. Timothy Dalton, the lead villain, man, I, I know that he's famous for his bond role. I haven't seen the bond movies, which you'd expect to be fair. Uh, he's just such a great villain. And I'm watching this. I'm like, where have I seen this dude before? Yeah. He's awesome. Uh, oh yeah. He's basically the same guy in 1923. He's trying to he's trying to get the the Dutton's land in the Yellowstone prequel, and he beats up those whores. Remember that scene? Ah, he makes them yeah. whip each other and torture each other and stuff. Okay, that's the same guy. Uh, so he's just a great villain character. So th- this movie had good performances, but I thought his was uh, exceptionally good. And I I just love this callback comedy stuff, like the fascist and hag bit with the crosswords, and there's the banter and the gunfight later. The swan seems like some stupid bit that doesn't mean anything until it doesn't the swan comes back and causes his dad to crash the car or whatever the ketchup bit that's yeah. a bar gag turned like a life-saving thing i just i love when <laughs> part of my humor i just love when bits are run into the ground as my wife can tell you <laughs> uh yeah i tend to think things are funnier the more you run them into the ground she would disagree <laughs> but okay so th- things i didn't necessarily like it i get that the setup is necessary because you have to establish um, the character of Nicholas Angel, you have to establish the premise of this town that it's so safe, but there's a lot of questionable characters within it. It takes some setup to do that. That said, it's about 40 minutes until we get to the first killing, which is a long time. <laughs> and and it's n- a couple of, of the premises, I think, getting there are not really useful or relevant. Number one, the girlfriend, like the scene with the girlfriend where she's like, oh, you work too hard and I'm over with. Like, okay, but that that doesn't mean anything later in the movie. It's not like their relationship has any effect on the plot. She doesn't come back. It just produces a couple of lame jokes and that's it. The girlfriend scene caught. There's the scene of the cops sitting around the pub socializing before the, the murders start coming. And they're, they're really making points that we already knew. Like, yes, Nicholas takes his job seriously. The rest of these cops don't. We got that. We learned that at the station. I get, you're making like a few jokes here and there. You're doing the catch up in the eye bit. Uh, trim this down. It's not bringing new yeah, yeah. plot development. So I, I wish it was a little tighter in getting to... It was quite long, too. It's two hours, and, and yeah. the second half is worth the wait. The second half is excellent. The first half is not trash, but like I said, it, it ha- I thought I was watching one of those British dad joke parades, and then it, then it just started getting really good. Second half is worth the wait, but when, you, when you're watching it fresh, or at least de facto fresh as I was and you don't know how good it's going to get in the second half it's easy to think it sucks in the first and I that's kind of where my mindset was I'm glad I didn't quit on it mentally and last point this isn't even like a fault of the movie I put it in my worst section because I think maybe the premise that the movie wants you to accept might be wrong philosophically but this Sanford cabal the people who run the town are they actually kind of right and I don't mean like killing people and and distorting the truth to suit their ends and all their stuff that they're doing that's evil pretty black and white i just mean (laughs) i'm sure you will agree isn't there some value to being a little more insular and a little bit more skeptical or hostile to outsiders because i'm i'm looking at the attitude of this of this nwa versus the attitude of politicians in power in the u.s and the uk right now who want open borders and as many immigrants and outsiders and newcomers as possible and it's like, well, yeah, but at least they aren't <laughs> letting someone else take them over. You know, like yeah. they might be, they might have their problems, but at least they're not bending over for conquest. At least they're fighting back. 
I like that. So like, is this, this cabal is evil, but are they actually the worst? And I don't think they're the worst. They have pride in their town and they're willing to protect their town from outside influence. We need, we don't need the cold blooded murders and the lying, but we need a little more of that spirit. We, we don't need any cold blood. I mean, <laughs> a few cold blooded well, murders. Please. It might take a few to get us out of the situation that we're in, but ideally no cold blooded murders. <laughs> Uh, anyway, yeah, I gave it, uh, I gave it a four out of five as you <laughs> correctly predicted. Ricky, 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 Ricky. Mm, pretty good. Pretty, 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 good. pretty good. And I thought, well, this breaks the mold of British comedy. I've, i if you, if I ever say there's no such thing as British comedy again, you can remind me of hot fuzz. And then I thought, well, is there another example? And I remembered I gave Kingsman a five too. So for as much as I rip on oh, British comedy, that movie sucks. British comedy's on a hot streak for me lately. What can I say? That's pretty recent, wasn't it? Kingsman? We watched that in the fall. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. As far as the audience reaction, let's see what people, uh, people are right there with, uh, with me uh, for wiki plurality. A lot of people giving it a five, almost a third of the early vote giving it a five, another quarter of the vote giving it a three like you had, but mostly positive people on this one. Not okay. Okay. Uh, as a reminder, if you'd like to discuss this movie with fellow listeners and uh, how wrong either one of us might be, you can check out the uh, dedicated channel on the community Discord server. Next week, we will watch the uh, the Boondock Saints, which I have not seen, but uh, seems like a movie. Wow. Based on the themes in the trailer, I think it might be up my alley. It's been a while. And uh, we still have two more weeks of, of eligibility for nominations from listener Matt. Remaining nominations are The Book of Eli, The Road, Nobody, Frailty, Jackie Brown, Fist Fight, or of course you can reject the list in favor of a randomly selected... If it's The Road, I cannot watch it again. I watched it six months ago. I well, then you're probably, you're probably fresh enough to review it. The movie is disturbing. Huh. I don't know anything about it. Uh... Or, or, of course, you can reject the list, too, and get a random top, top-rated top movie instead. But as a reminder, if you'd like to read my movie reviews, comment how wrong I am, submit your own rating, vote for the next movie, and sign up for the chance to be the movie nominator for the month, the one and only place to do all of those things is in my weekly movie review column linked in the description and on the homepage of the website. That is mattchristiansandmedia.com or mattis.k. Let's catch up on chat. Let's okay. see. Okay. I got uh, just a couple on Rumble here. Addicted to Drums says, thanks. No, thank you, sir. Your continued support. I assume, sir. I, I don't know. Might be might be a ma'am. Uh, but thank you for your support. There was another ma'am moment. There was some, you know, the famous GameStop, like, it is ma'am, Tranny. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There was a ma'am moment, moment at some kind of like city council meeting or something. Oh, really? Yeah. A Tranny was speaking to a city council or some sort of government body. And the whoever was the government representative on the panel said, thank you, sir. And the guy, it is ma'am, and Thanks walked away <laughs> angry. Uh, Hillbilly Deluxe says, small point. It wasn't that the NWA wanted to keep crime statistics down. They uh, wanted to win Best Village of the Year award, but it was for the greater good. Shut it. Well, there were several points made about the intent of keeping crime statistics down uh, specifically. What's his face? The Dalton villain character. When when he got his grocery store got robbed, mm-hmm. he said, like, we don't want him to become just another crime statistic. You know? But I suppose uh, maybe you're right that they only care about crime statistics insofar as it gets them the recognition. Um, I guess the dispute would be, are the crime statistics, are the low crime stats the end or are they in pursuit of like some other thing that they're looking for. Right. But mm-hmm. yeah. Um, in any case, the, the parallels to, to what we're looking at with our politicians now, I think are pretty striking. Uh, thank you. Hillbilly deluxe. Let's see. We're good on odyssey and we're good on D live. So let's catch up on YouTube and tippy. Sure. All right, Fat Hooligan, have you all been following James O'Keefe's work? His infiltration of the detention centers was insane. Disguises and fake ac- fake accents are also hilarious. Dudes, fearless. I've seen some some tidbits on Twitter, but I haven't been following this too closely. The, the the thing I saw most recently was he found the judge in the Trump civil case, the Latidia James case. Uh-huh. He he found the judge in that case at at a at a, a gym. And apparently the guy creeps on women at the gym and he got footage of this guy creeping on women at the gym. He's like this like young women, right? Yeah. And, you know, I I have my own um, 
in general, I think like filming at gyms is a no, no on principle, but I get what he's doing here. And then yeah. uh, O'Keefe got banned from the gym on account of that. So there was some kind of a funny phone conversation about that. But, you know, I mean, I'm not going to I'm not going to sit here in pearl clutch about like the privacy rights of a guy at, at the gym who is bent on ruining the political norms of this country and effectively stealing from yeah. uh, a major party candidate. I mean, they, they, yep. they, on principle, I don't I don't like doing that to people at the gym, but. I also don't like people who steal millions and millions of dollars from people just because they have the political power to do it. Nobody so, should be able to film anything at the gym. Uh, in, if I ran a gym, that would be the rule. I don't. I don't care if you're doing it to to spy on someone. I don't care if you're a content creator. Anybody who's like, not that I'm saying there shouldn't be any gym content on social media if that's what you want to make or something. But for the most part, these people who are trying to be like influencers and film themselves doing workouts not not for the sake of instruction even but just for the sake of like you know yeah. the type i'm talking about not people who are telling you how to work out properly people who like 20 year old chicks who are doing hip thrusters in yeah. front of the camera yeah. like why, why are you doing that we all know why you're doing that. we know why yeah yep um daniel yeager if you guys want to look up the dude who originally canceled shane gillis is it gillis yeah uh search seth Simon spoken bird poetry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Actually, I ha it's 34 seconds. Do you, I could play it. Do you want to listen to it? Yeah, sure. Uh, why don't you read one more? I'll prep this so you can hear it. Jonathan Prezios is annoying about the Fanny case because we are having this whole big ordeal with multiple weeks of hearing. It shouldn't matter when the dates when the dating started. Uh, she is in a position to gain something from it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, um, I, well, I guess, could I, could I make the case for the other side of it that it's okay? I guess their argument is it's okay if he was hired not because he was her boyfriend, but on the basis of his own professional qualifications. And if any, um, personal expenditures they had together were reimbursed by her, that's the best case they have. Like, we had no per we had no romantic relationship when he was hired and any personal stuff we had after the fact I was reimbursed for. Yeah. The point of the chat would be that's still unethical. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, to the to the extent you're paying your romantic interest, public money and per like, OK, so you only, only half your vacation was paid for on that basis. I know. I mean, yeah, it's, so it's, what? yeah, it's still pretty, uh, pretty questionable to the point you, you want to see this. um this guy's spoken his, sure. his bird poetry. All right, let's check this out. Did you drop it into the video? Show? No, yeah, it's right here. Okay, uh, 34 cool. seconds with Seth Simons. Spoken bird poetry. Hello, I'm Seth Simons, uh, director of the Exelano Project. This Am I walking a into a trap here? Is he going to like say it's the N-word? Bird. Oh. <clears throat> Ka! Ka! oh, it's actual Ka -ka! bird poetry. I got it. Eagle, eagle, eagle. Thank you. That last one was a mockingbird imitating an eagle. God bless America. What happened to comedy? Uh, <laughs> my official rating is... You suck, fuck you. All right. <laughs> Yikes. Oh, I better start hustling yeah. for some of these. If you, you got you got a baby to take care of, I understand. So I can I can. I don't hear her crying yet, so All I'm right. gonna do. I'll do some more. Uh, Laurel says, "My sister and I bought 80 acres in Missouri. My son and I have been renovating small house and land, but we stopped for two weeks to build a bridge to bring in supplies. We are wow. exhausted. Wow, that sounds like be, a serious job, Laurel. It must be out there. At first, I, I I was thinking the tile guy was in Missouri. He's not. He's in California. It's the other guy who's in Missouri. Right. Yeah. But I was going to say, if you need tile at your new compound, I know a guy who needs work. <laughs> Maybe he'd come down from Eureka. I don't know. Yeah, really? Uh, no, that's great. I'm glad to hear that uh, you and your family are building uh, good things and, and all the best. And like I said, if, if things get really hot, uh, I, I'm going to have to make a decision. Do I go North Idaho or do I go Missouri? North Idaho is probably closer, I guess, but. You cannot go to Missouri. I'm telling you the weather there is just terrible. What's wrong with Ferguson? That seems pretty safe. It is really safe. Yeah. I know but a guy who has a very safe convenience store. That's hardly ever robbed. <laughs> <Yeah>, really? 
Boogeyman 917 says, I doubt it. Brandon Wilkes, what up, my hot and tots? Just a friendly reminder to collect physical media because Global Homo will eventually rewrite our trigger warning everything that you knew from Raw Doll to Mary Poppins. Yeah, Mary I'm Poppins doubting. got it for something so stupid. I can't even remember what it was. I'm not doubting that premise. I'm just crediting Boogeyman because I was. It was hot late. and tots. That's why he said that. Um. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Uh, that's the thing, and I I know I'm falling into this trap too because even for like the movie review stuff, um. Most of the time I'm just renting, like I'll, I'll rent off an online streaming service and that's fine. Um, or like we've bought a few movies off online streaming services that our son wants to watch or stuff, you know, things like cars or whatever, mm-hmm. um, which is very convenient because you just fire up the TV and it's already on there. You want to watch cars for the 50th time. Great. Here's cars. But then, I mean, yeah, it's it's on some server somewhere that ha- you, number one, you have to have an Internet connection to access it. That's a yeah. problem. And number two, if they decide you aren't worthy of that Internet connection anymore uh, by virtue of whatever they don't like about you, then it's not yours anymore. So it does like I don't I don't own physical media like that anymore at all. In fact, like most of what I used to buy was video games. I couldn't tell you the last time I bought a video game on an actual disc. Uh, probably probably a decade plus i don't and a movie on a disc i don't know and while that's super convenient and i I love the technology that allows that to to be the delivery mechanism there is a downside and yeah all of that all of that entertainment and knowledge could be erased in a moment's notice yep yeah it's troubling what will we even do for entertainment we'd have to talk to each other read books it's a disaster you got to do the puppet shows with like the candle you know make the shadows no, that's what I meant. Shadow, you know, you would like they're shadow puppets. Yeah, that's yeah, the term. shadow puppets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I got you. John Falsetta. What's up, Mike Knigas? Happy you got rid of the AIDS, Matt. Of the two of us, I'm the one with AIDS, okay? That's right. I forgot. Thank you. Uh, Jared, the correct way to pronounce it. Speaking of correct <laughs> pronunciations, the correct way to pronounce it is antibiotics, not antibiotics. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You ever have words like that where you go back and forth and pronouncing it two different ways, but you never really decide? That's one of those. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess I you. lean antibiotics. No, no. Now that sounds wrong. Now I say antibiotics. I'm going with that. Mm. Mint 20 says, if the regime was smart, they would bring Trump back. Then everyone would believe in the regime again. and White boys would sign up to die in their wars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, that's, that's not a bad play, actually. Yeah, you want to fix the the military recruitment problem. Trump will probably help that quite a bit. Yeah. So not a bad idea. See? Maybe. James Atkins. I found the statue. Conspiracy to commit vandalism while owning a Hitler poster. There it is. So much hate in that heart. Moist fart. Times, man. Now that Black History Month is over, feel free to reunite with our with your abandoned children or replace the battery and smoke detector or don't. I don't really give a shit. Love you, faggots. You suck. Fuck you. <laughs> well, I hope you are doing well, uh, Mr. Moist Farts. I know uh, I, 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 I know you've been dealing with the health episode, so I hope, I hope everything's going well for you. And um, I, I mean this as a sign of respect. Well, I want to play. You there suck. Fuck you. Um, why wow, that guy got more time than the mass killer in London that stabbed a bunch of people on camera and got no prison time due to a claim of mental illness. I, was that the guy where they try to defend themselves with the narwhal test? I don't know if that was the same guy or not, but hmm. I, and I don't know specifically who this guy is, but I could certainly believe it. That an actual violent attacker was treated more leniently than the guy who promoted stickers that say like, maybe they're wrong about immigration. <laughs> <laughs> just like yeah, think really. about it a little bit <laughs> that is basically what it said citizen seven i'm not reading this matt gorilla grip p word is what we old schoolers used to say used to refer to as a snapping p word a snapping p word uh oh like the the turtle right that's that's disgusting it must be a turtle reference uh-huh totally okay <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan Prezios, the honey rust trail. I'm going back and forth between guilty and innocent because it seems that the real problem is so many empowered females sucking at their jobs, including the head case detective. Um, yeah, yeah, it's possible. I mean, there were live rounds on there, so. It, and it seems most plausible that that Hannah Gutierrez Reed is the one responsible for that. I, I would assume. 
So yeah. as always, you know, whenever we talk about like Alec Baldwin and 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 some sympathy for Hannah Gutierrez read, um, or at least the case that she made about Alec Baldwin's lack of concern on the set. Like it's, it's never to exonerate her. I'm not trying to pretend like she's a hero or something. She seems like she probably was, uh, probably did not do a good job. Probably did not. I assume maybe did take the guns target shooting. Maybe did improperly mix, um, blanks and or dummies with live ammo. But, uh, I just, I, I think that, that it's also true that she's probably going to be the scapegoat for Alec Baldwin's, uh, behavior and Alec Baldwin's, um, I think irresponsibility leading up to the shooting and Alec Baldwin's direct action of pointing and pulling the trigger. It's not to say she has no responsibility. I just think she's going to take on uh, probably any and all responsibility that Alec Baldwin legitimately had. Yeah. Is the most likely outcome. Um, Oh, there she goes. All right. I'll read one more. I actually did see one that just came in for me, so I should read that one. Okay. Um, I'm a psychopath says, Blonde, if you sold a property this year, you have to 1031 that shit into something else if possible and defer the capital gain tax if you can. I'm sure my accountant's all over it. And then FYI, on your IRS 1040, they require you to report and declare income from stolen goods and illegal activities. That's, that's Is a that real true? fucking thing. I, I guess I, I can believe that. <laughs> Please tell us about your theft. I mean, maybe some people do. Oh, and then Slosher also said, Blonde, the left is not afraid of things swinging back because it's not a pendulum, it's a racket. The Dems use power... When they win and the cons seek neutrality. Yeah, there's probably truth to that too. That's so true. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. We will see you guys. Well, Skag's going to hang around and do the rest of these. We have like 10 more super chats and then I'm going to go feed the baby. All right. Godspeed. Sunday. We'll catch you next week. Let me get the weird double image of myself off. Hold on. There we go. Uh, okay. We'll, we'll close up with the rest of the chat here. I should have found out where she left off. My mistake. Uh, two dogs, Mike D I think, right? When enough invaders are in North Africa and Europe, the elite will close the doors and lock them in. The women are completely unprotected and they are already making their tropical estates in their resource rich paradises. I assume that, yeah, it's like, There is the question of like, how do you think you can import like all the world's criminals openly and not face the consequences for that eventually, even if it gives you political benefit in the short term? And maybe that's the answer. Maybe there's some like fallout. Maybe there's some there's some bug out plan that they have for when they when they've reduced the country to ruin and they have to pursue their own safety. Maybe that maybe that's the way it'll go. Chubby Stubby says, Mr. Uh, Stay Puff <laughs> with the white fro has clearly not actually looked at the SCOTUS rulings records. Of course, all leftists and Dems feel like Roe versus Wade and now hearing immunity case deletes all previous actions. Well, yeah, I mean, for the most part, people do not read the reasoning in court cases. They simply look at the end result and decide if they like the end result or not as a political matter and determine if the court was correct or not on that basis, which, of course, is exactly the wrong analysis for the court to use. The court is not, not just the Supreme court, any court, they're not supposed to pursue their political preferences. They're supposed to uh, apply the law as it's written and, and follow the law where it leads, whether they personally like the conclusion or the outcome or not. And I think the problem is we've largely lost track of that in this country for all the complaining about the Supreme court, supposedly being a, a nine member super legislature, I mean, I think in many ways, if it's not now, it has been for decades. But these people complaining about that, it would seem to me that's exactly what you want. You want a nine member super legislature that just does what Congress does, produce policies that you like just in a a different way uh, and in in a more centralized way. And if you don't want that, if instead you want a court that just applies the law and uh, produces the outcome that the law demands, well, then you're going to have to understand that sometimes you win your preferences, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, because it's not about pursuing what your preferred policy outcome is. It's about pursuing what the law demands. But as always, I'm completely confused about their view about what the court or the court system is supposed to be, because it's completely contradictory. On the one hand, um, they're very, very bad for overturning Roe versus Wade but they're also very, very bad for centralizing power when, in fact, Roe versus Wade was the opposite of that. It was a return of power. It was a decentralization of power. 
the the only thing that makes that make sense is I don't like that abortions aren't a nationally protected so-called right. But what the law has to say about that is a completely different question than what you would prefer the policy to be. Another uh, joke. Thank you, Chubby Stubby. Another joke about uh, Ellie Mistel. Fee fi fo fum. I want to get rid of the Supreme Court double stuffed Don, uh, Don King. Yeah, he is quite a character. Um, <laughs> and it, I mean, yeah, it's like, uh, oh, I don't like what they did. Uh, and therefore they're illegitimate. Well, if that's the stance, like I don't like what this particular political body did, therefore they have no institutional legitimacy. We get ready for chaos. That's justification to undo everything. So Godspeed in the coming, uh, in the coming 1860s reenactment to uh, double stuff Don King. Thank you, Knuckle Hunky Buck. Mustache Man's favorite femboy furry VT. You want... <laughs> <laughs> is this fanny language? I don't even. Can I read this? Okay. You, you, uh, I let my boy Fuendo. <laughs> do, okay. This is do a. Uh, in my. And didn't wear a. a <laughs> is this supposed to be fanny? Oh, wait, this isn't even fanny. This is just like complaining about the con. Like, I, well, yeah, I had unprotected sex and now I have to face the consequences of a pregnancy. Can I get an abortion? Uh, maybe this is making. F- <laughs> I, mustache man, this isn't even like a. That's disgusting. I, I, I'm not trying to, to, to protect myself from Raja Mahan censorship or something. I don't even know how to read this. If this is like Ebonics or something, it's so advanced that I, I can't even. <laughs> I can hardly decipher it. But I'm trying to convey the idea, which is like, um, yeah, if you have unprotected sex, there are certain consequences that result from that. And if you don't accept those consequences, perhaps try not having unprotected sex would be the solution. Thank you, man. Slosher says, Blonde and, uh, Blonde, oh, Slosher, we, we read. Uh, thank you, Slosher. Uh, Aggie Jet Pilot, catch the show tomorrow. Everyone have a good night. Thank you for tuning in and supporting the show. Appreciate it very much. Two Dogs Mike D, no, Your Honor, my client did not rob the bank because if he was a bank robber, then he'd have robbed every bank. <laughs> was, as far as I understood the argument, that was kind of it. It's like, no, you, you couldn't possibly have committed uh, some sort of uh, infraction in this case because they had opportunity to commit other infractions but didn't. Right, well... <laughs> Yeah, to your point, just because you're a bank robber doesn't mean you can rob every single one. Uh, Mint, I've heard the argument that gun ownership in the USA is basically a cope shield for the right, as in as long as you, as long as the right has some access to firearms, the the thought that they may be able to use them will keep us feeling as though we still have control and prevent the right from organizing into any sort of serious political opposition to the regime. Thoughts on that? Um, well, if they, if they keep that as sort of like an appeasement mechanism, they don't do a great job with it because they're constantly chipping away at that. Right. So if there's sort of an intentional, if that's supposed to be like an intentional bone thrown to, uh, thrown to us to keep us happy and believing that we have uh, a way to protect our rights in the way that we don't, they're not very good at that because they, they keep reducing it. Uh, and they keep, they keep going after it and they keep, re- they keep chipping away at it in any number of ways. Uh, but as, as we were discussing earlier in the show, I mean, a firearm is a tool. It's a very useful tool. And I think everybody should have that tool at their disposal, generally speaking, but that tool is not a substitute for the character of the operator. And as long as we have, uh, people in this country who are, are willing to allow their rights to be violated and, and I'm not putting myself in some separate category of bravery here. Like, Oh, everybody else is too cowardly to like rise up against the government or something like that. It's not, it's not that of course I would have the same reservations that anybody else would have. I have everything to protect that everybody else does a job, kids, all that stuff, family. Um, but it is to say that like, if you don't have the courage to fight immorality and injustice, when is it, when it's at your doorstep or when it is threatening you, then the firearm itself doesn't mean a lot. It's, it's just sitting there. It's not doing anything. You could have, I mean, you have this idea in your head that one day it will save you. But if that day, if you consistently accept aggression towards you and the violation of your rights up until the point that they're kicking down your door to take your gun anyway, and to violate your rights in any number of ways, perhaps the, the use for that tool has, has passed. So I certainly take the point that you're saying meant that the mere possession of them shouldn't be treated as sufficient. Um, 
because the, the the lawful possession of them means that they have some sort of uh, intended application. And again, this is all theoretical fa uh, fan fiction based on the Declaration of Independence that would never happen in real life. Just saying, like, if we accept the moral premise that you have a right to own these things, the question is why? Uh, on what, in what circumstances would they be justifiably deployed? And if we aren't brave enough to confront those circumstances, the tool itself doesn't matter all that much. That said, it's a great day to buy another gun. So I'd encourage everyone to go out and do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mint. Uh, and Godspeed. Give a refresh here. And... Um, Wow, holy God, I got several more to uh to read here. Uh Plan was saying ten, but we got I got I got a backlog here. Let me uh let me get through these. Actually, I can't even find where I left off. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Mike, what is the what is this? Seahawk what what kind of trap name is this? Mike Seahawk? Nice try, Mike, but I'm on to you. All these, uh, that's probably his real name, actually. I'm <laughs> just, I'm paranoid by the traps. All these guys work together in the same courthouse. They eat at the same sandwich shop. $150 donation is just a professional courtesy. They all did it, but the chumminess of these people may weigh more. Yeah, um, I, I, I guess to your point, I don't know how normal that is for judges or not, uh, or people in this legal profession. I don't know. I mean, obviously I would prefer he not have done that. But at the same time, I don't see a lot of obvious bias from this particular judge, at least in granted, I haven't seen every moment of, of every hearing, but he doesn't seem like a guy who's wildly in Fanny's corner or something like that. So I'm not super concerned about it, but some people are are raising concern on that issue. Uh, thank you, Mike. Knuckle Hunky Buck. That's what made us dangerous, Mint 20. When the hammer drops, it won't be the establishment versus the resistance boys or whatever. It'll be the establishment versus every blade of grass. Yeah, that's the that, and that's the aim. It's just the question of do we have do we have the courage, do we have the fortitude to actually be armed in those blades of grass when the day comes? I hope yes. And and like I said, I hope I'm brave enough if the situation demanded that. Not everybody else do that for me. I hope I'm brave enough. Uh, but <laughs> easier said than done, man. Uh, that's, uh, that's not a casual thing to do. Mike also says Holloway broke the text on Megan Kelly. He says it comes down to if McAfee has the stones to make a hundred enemies in the local Atlantic court scene, a new judge, he is 50, 50. He knows all these people. I suppose that's another thing that I hadn't uh, thought about it was just professional considerations for him. Like, does he care about burning bridges that might damage his own career? I hope that he's above that. Nobody gets through the legal profession without having some professional conflict. It's an adversarial business by nature. So I would hope he's not afraid of that. But we also know how Democrats treat their enemies. And uh, you would you would expect that to, to work against him at some point if he does disqualify Fannie. Mint 20 uh, also says, I wish I shared your confidence, Knuckle. How many gun owners in this country are hood rats? Uh, that would side with their patrons. How many are old boomers who buy into the regime's way of thinking? And I think he had one more here. How many are single issue voters that as long as they can use their, uh, that as long as their precious guns aren't taken away, they won't care if the regime genocides our people. I love the spirit gun owner too, but we need pragmatism. Um, yeah. I mean, I think you guys are, are probably mostly on the same page. It's, I, I think, I think the dispute is just what I'm trying to get at, which is like, do we have, the revolution was achieved by men of remarkable wisdom and, and moral fortitude. Uh, do we have men of that character today? I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I doubt that. Well, let's put it this way. Like if, if I had to, if I had to form some kind of militia with my neighbors in my immediate surrounding, I would actually feel pretty confident. When I look at people on the internet, I feel no confidence. <laughs> So uh, maybe it's one of those questions of like the internet's not quite real life. Um, I hope that's the case. I hope that's the case, but uh, all you can do uh, number one, you can try to be a person of courage yourself, but number two, you can try to surround yourself with similar people. So, you know, I, I if you're in, a, I, I really worry about how the end of the year is going to go here. So if you're a person who's surrounded by people who would happily kick down your door and take all your stuff, um, if they had the chance, 
consider how that might play out, I guess, later on in the year. You know, I, I understand the idea of sticking in a blue state and fighting for the place that you grew up and where you've built everything you have. I get it. And I think that's admirable. But I also worry about um, how bad things could get if these people decide that you're the enemies and now's the time, which it seems like things progress that way. Citizen 7 says, regarding Trump being removed from several state ballots, number one, he's never been charged or convicted of insurrection. Number two, per the um, uh, per Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, only Congress has the power to remove him. And that latter part, I think, uh, is is exactly the argument that they're going to go with, that it is not up to the Colorado State Supreme Court or even the Supreme Court to make the determination of what is an insurrectionist as is enforceable by the 14th Amendment, because you're right, Section 5 is right there, and it says the terms of this amendment, paraphrase, the terms of this amendment shall be enforced by Congress. And Congress has made no such enforcement effort in this case, and so... If you want to disqualify Trump on the basis that he's an insurrectionist, Congress can do that. But it's not for the Supreme Court to do. It's not for the Colorado Supreme Court to do. I think that's probably the route that they're going to go. Um, If people are interested in those legal arguments, a couple weeks ago, I had a Harvard law professor, Lawrence Lessig, on my Wednesday show over on Tenet Media. And we went through some of those arguments and what he expects as far as the court's decision uh, to be. And it was an interesting conversation because uh, he is a firmly anti-Trump guy. Um, and, but he, he, he's also a man who understands the basic principles of the law and, uh, number one wants, but number two expects a nine Oh unanimous decision against disqualification. So, um, if you're interested in that discussion, you can find that on my, uh, YouTube or on uh, tenant media's YouTube channel. Or if you, if you want to find it easily, just head on over to, um, to my website, mattchristiansandmedia.com. Check out the, uh, the, the Matt Christensen hour playlist and you'll find it right there. It's on the homepage. Hunk, Hunky Buck is adding to the, um, to the mint conversation. He says, I doubt the gun owning boomer pro tyranny demographic is nearly as large as you think. Hood rats aren't going to take up arms in the name of the government. <laughs> I suppose that's true. Like if you talk about like, when the time comes for Joe Biden to raid the red states, can he count on um, Chicago warriors to <laughs> to fight for him? I doubt it. Good luck. Uh, thank you guys for the spirited discussion and, of course, for supporting the show. Very much appreciated. It looks like there's a little bit more coming up here, too. Brad Wolf says, for cleavage, virtue signaling and social media. Uh, is that you mean the purpose of your chat is for cleavage? I don't know. Uh, if so... Uh, Whatever brings you to to watch the show and to and to support the show is much appreciated. Thank you, Brent. Uh, Knuckle Hunky Buck says we need some communi- we need some communication of ideas, but organization makes us vulnerable to outside influence. Um, yeah, and the, 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 clue the uh, or fed, cue the fed, fed sound fed, right. Fed, fed, fed. Yeah, and I get why people get annoyed with that too. It's like, oh, anybody who's trying to organize on behalf of um, conservative, libertarian, uh, minimize the federal government in general type ideas is labeled a Fed and, and ostracized. And if we ever want to actually do that successfully, you have to get over that and you have to welcome that sort of discussion. I agree. I mean, it's the same kind of thing. I don't get me wrong. I like the Fed bit. It's funny, but you do have to get over that at some point. In the same way, the joke about like losing all your guns in a boating accident is funny but it sort of grants the premise that you have to hide your guns to hide from these people. And at some point we have to get over it and, and, and recognize that these people are exercising illegitimate unconstitutional authority. And no, I don't have to lose all my guns in a boating accident. They're right here and you can come and take them if you want to, if you want to try, that is, I'm not surrendering them. Uh, you're going to have a fight on your hands. It's that kind of mentality that has to be adopted eventually. And I, and I take that point for sure. Knuckle hunky buck. Also says, just think of the scene from V for Vendetta. It was an uprising of the people in response to everything that had become obvious when V pointed out what they were all thinking. It wasn't an organization. Yeah, I I suppose like, I mean, if we're going to continue on the path of things will get worse and worse and worse until they're just intolerable, obviously intolerable by everybody. Maybe it doesn't require organization. Maybe everybody's just so pissed off that it just happens. Could go that route too. Two Dogs Mike D says, just got called into work at the hospital in the Sierra Nevada snowstorm. Wow. Thanks for keeping me and my dog company on the drive. Well, Godspeed on that drive. I know uh, based on what I've seen out of the Lake Tahoe area. Yeah, uh, it, it looks like it's it's insane. The, the most snow overnight I've ever seen in my life, and I've lived in a lot of snowy places intentionally because I love the mountains and I love snow. 
uh, but was um, not South Lake Tahoe, uh, but uh, what was the town? Tahoe City. Tahoe City was where I was staying, kind of out by what used to be called what used to be called Squaw Valley, but that's politically incorrect now. Um, and my car, I was driving like a sedan car at the time, and the snow overnight was like up over the hood of the car from one night's worth of snowfall. It's, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. And so those Tahoe storms are really insane. And and um, and then when I, I had to drive back around the lake and through Lake uh, South Lake Tahoe to get back to the Bay Area, and that ended up taking me like 10 hours or something like that the next day because the snow was so insane. So if you're in one of those kind of crazy drives, Godspeed. And the one thing I learned, have a, an empty bottle in your car so that you can pee in your car. Because if you have to stop to get out of the traffic to go pee, you're never going to get back into that line of traffic again. California traffic, carry a bottle or traffic anywhere. Carry a pee bottle in your car. That way you don't have to surrender your spot in the line. Das Pooch says everything Biden's administration says about the border makes sense to them. Flooding us with millions of third worlders is the goal. Remember the waves of non-white immigration clip of then Vice President Biden. Mayorkas was sitting next to him. I do remember the quote, I think, something to the effect of like white people are going to be a minority and that's good. I didn't know if um, I didn't know Mayorkas was right next to him. If that's the clip I'm thinking of, I'll have to look it up. Thank you, Das Pooch. Eric Sean, Blondes Milker's Heart. That's it. That's the message. Well, how dare you? I can't believe you would say such a thing. That's disgusting. Thanks for supporting the show, man. Uh, Bocifa says, Matt, I love your soap, but I would love a midday refresher. Uh, Blonde, I don't know if it's possible, but how about uh, repping Grandma Towler's tea? I don't know if it's available in the U.S. This, I assume, is a reference to um, the the family of the man imprisoned in the U.K. over the uh, sticker thing. So they must they must do tea. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know anything about their family business. Blonde might. So if there's an opportunity to try to pump up their family business a little bit or something like that, I'm, I'm totally open to it. Uh, thank you, Bocephus. You, and thank you for leaving the door open to buying some soap in addition to the tea. That is much appreciated though. It's, it would seem that the, uh, the needs of the tea are probably a little bit more pressing at the moment. Uh, Knuckle Hunky Buck says, "Hoop dreams too. Loop dreams. Loop dreams. That that's the that's the joke I was looking for uh, with um with the the noose man, the noose man trying to get out of uh, the 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 St. Louis struggle." He also says, "To hoop to loop." <laughs> Can I say this one? Uh, electric Nougaloo? That's close. He said the N word. I think I can say that. Tortuga. You know that Indian crying in the front of all the garbage? Yeah, he was Italian. Yeah, um, yeah the the guy, the famous guy with the one tear coming out of uh, coming out of his eye, looking at at uh, nineteen seventies, nineteen eighties commercial, looking at um, litter or whatever it was. Uh, Chief Boyardee is his nickname, Chief Boyardee, because he was Italian but presented as an Indian. Slosher says, Matt, uh, glad you liked Hot Fuzz, my favorite comedy of all time. Sorry. That's high praise. Wow. Sorry, but I'll, I'll tell you a bit of trivia every fan knows. Kate Blanchett was Nick's girlfriend and is uncredited. Also, some of Danny's lines were cut from the uh, from the new girlfriend character. If that's it, though, if it's like, oh, my girlfriend, I need to have a way to have my girlfriend in the movie, then I'm even less of a fan. I don't even I like it even less at that point. And, it, and, and I like, yeah, the callback bits are good, I guess. Um, I mean, I, I'll grant that point. I liked them. I, I guess I missed the callback reference to her. There was some line, it must be some line I didn't pick up on. Uh, but man, I, like, I, I think for the movie to, to creep on a five wiki for me, which is conceivable, you just got to cut, cut some of that first 40 or so minutes down. Got to get to the, to where the movie excels a little bit quicker. But it's um it's still very good and it's still an enjoyable watch for sure. Esoterica Unbound says, in response to a super chat at the end of the last show, you stated women want the leadership of the man in their life. I don't believe that to be so. What they actually seem to want is to avoid accountability for their actions. I don't know that those are mutually exclusive. I think women do naturally crave male leadership. Um, but men who embrace leadership have to be there and be willing to provide it for them. If they do seek to avoid accountability, well, I mean, in some ways a husband shields his wife from 
all the many dangers of life. It's not to say that she shouldn't be responsible for like killing a person or something like that. But if, if there's truth to what you're saying, like that, that women seek to avoid accountability for their actions, part of that might just be the safety that they seek naturally through men. And there's nothing necessarily, there's nothing wrong with that instinct. It, it can be wrong. Of course, if you, you know, if they're committing crimes for which they don't want to be held accountable, which I think we see plenty of the more we see, a lot of women in, in leadership positions or in traditionally male places. Um, I think there's, I think there's plenty of that going on, but yeah, I, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with the point on accountability. I would just say that I don't know that those two things are, are necessarily mutually exclusive. They might be sort of um, different effects of the same base instinct. Uh, Long Dong John says, Matt and I, <laughs> God. Matt and I once had butt sex don't worry, Blonde. We did it for the greater good. The greater good. Good to see the correct opinion was reached on Hot Fuzz. Even if Matt was... <laughs> this is the Bernie word. Can I... <clears throat> Man, I'm going to have to... Okay. Can I say that word, Raju Mahan? Even if Matt was niggardly... <sighs> Careful. On the fifth word. Uh, well, thank you for uh, for that narrative. It was a delightful story. You are gay. Esoterica Unbound. Women supposed. Uh, lack agency is their primary claim to resources produced by others. Exerting control over their own circumstances mean, uh, means abandoning such a claim, which they are instinctively loath to do. Yeah, I, I wouldn't dispute that diagnosis either. And, and you know, whenever you talk about these things, people think that that means inferiority or something. Um, like women are worse than or not as good as men. Men and women are two necessary pieces to the same puzzle, of course. And that puzzle is the uh, the furtherance of humanity itself it, it's the it's the production of children it's the building of families it's making sure we all survive to have some meaning on this earth and so when you talk about women seeking male leadership or uh, not responding well to traditionally male roles well that's because they in general men and women have roles in which they excel and they're complementary and the more we just blur those and act like they're they're the same actually there's no difference whatsoever the more you're going to see unhappy men and misbehaving men and unhappy women and misbehaving women. We're seeing that all over the place. And so, uh, so yeah, I don't, I don't dispute your, um, your diagnosis there at all. Women have amazing natural capabilities and talents that not only should be put to their productivity, which is the, the construction of families, but it's what makes women most happy when they do. Uh, men and women alike are happy when they have happy, stable, productive families and to propagandize people out of that arrangement is to make them unhappy and to make them unstable, which some would say is of course the design that when people are unhappy and unstable, they are vulnerable and they must have someone to fix it for them. And that's where big daddy government and the power interests that be, uh, fill that gap. Uh, so, uh I'm a psychopath had the, the tax tips for blonde. Thank you for that. Uh, thanks for supporting the show. Injured Guardian said, did Neil hide my super chat again? I might have to take steps. I don't think so. Did we? Uh, well, I'll tell you what. Let me refresh Injured Guardian and I can go check in another spot through my channel. I don't remember missing one from you. This is the only one that I have that came through here is the one you just sent. So let me go into the um, into my channel itself and see if I can find it. But that's going to take me a second. So bear with me. In fact, didn't I do this once before? Didn't I go searching for an injured guardian chat in exactly this way like a few weeks ago? Probably. Okay. Here's the big long list of super chats in YouTube's official record. Okay, there's the one you said. Did he hide it? I, you know what? You might be right because this one came in tonight and I don't see it in my list. So I, I don't know what the hell happened with this. Deadwood Mini Rant. The real Con Stapleton was a strong wrestler and a good sheriff, not a fat, drunken moron uh, toadying to Cy Tolliver. No offense to the actor. It's just annoying writing. End of rant. There were a lot of I mean, Deadwood, the show, the HBO show, a lot of those characters are real life characters, of course, but so many of them are misrepresented. Seth Bullock himself, none of this like nonsense about uh, marrying his brother's widow, whatever it was. That's not a thing. In fact, like Seth Bullock and, and Wild Bill are portrayed as like friends, 
but they never actually interacted in Deadwood. There's all kinds of stuff like that. Um, or if they did, I think Seth Bullock like arrived in Deadwood the day Wild Bill got shot or something like that. It was close, but they really didn't interact. Um, yeah. I mean, De- Deadwood's a great show and the lore of Deadwood is still cool, even if it is not really a historically accurate show. So I take your point. And by the way, I, if you, if you, I know that one of these was not, I missed the one the first time. So if you want a refund in your guardian, just send me an email. I'll get you that 10 bucks back. I'm sorry. We missed it the first time. I don't know what the hell happened with that, but I'm glad you let me know. And uh, knuckle hunky buck says an organization requires a command to move. Every blade of grass just responds to the wind blowing too hard, getting very metaphorical, very poetic, but, um, but yeah, I'll take your point um, that maybe we, when the times get tough enough, organization is uh is secondary to the the practical necessities, I suppose. Um, thank you, Knuckle Hunky Buck. Appreciate it. And Mint as well. And every other super chatter. I think I'm all set. Let me give a couple quick refreshes here and make sure we're good. Yeah, looks like we're all set there. Rumble, we're good. Odyssey, we're good. DLive, we're good, which means it is time to call it a show. So thank you guys for hanging out with us this evening. Very much appreciated. My God, I didn't expect a three-hour stream, but it happens sometimes. Thanks for um, supporting the show with your chats. Thanks for tuning in live. If you're listening later on demand, thank you kindly as well for your support for the show. If you'd like more to listen to, remember there's plenty more over on my website, mattchristensenmedia.com. I've got my new Wednesday show up and running. There's some extra material on the audio feeds of the show. You can check all of uh, check all of that out on the website. I can't even talk anymore past three hours. I don't know why I even try. Uh, anything show related, mattchristensenmedia.com is where you find it. We will be like I said, I can't talk. We will be back here next Sunday because if it's Sunday, sorry, it's not Meet the Press. It is the Matt and Blonde Show. Have a great night.